Good evening. We're back. Um, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Back with Gabriel in the house. And um, Gabriel, how are you? Better now. Yeah, man. Um, you just had a major uh, election. We have elections going on tonight in, in the United States. No, no word yet. But maybe as we progress some... Um, news will come come out i don't know but um yeah what's the vibe like after the lula thing i, I very briefly uh i think it's oscillating between uh jubilant relief post-traumatic stress disorder and uh feeling like nothing happened it's one of the three things depending on the time of day uh yeah but i think generally a sense of relief of Things are going to, you know, start changing a bit and, but a lot of work ahead and still a lot to understand about what actually happened and what, what's going to be the state of mm -hmm. the right wing after the loss. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. So, um, interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm mean, very, very excited that Bolsonaro is out, but, um, much to be said, but that's not why we're here tonight. So. Followers of our channel, of our uh, study groups will remember, gosh, when was this? Early on in the pandemic, <clears throat> we organized a really good set of workshops, which was led by Gabriel on Karatani's The Structure of World History. And those workshops um, gave us a chance to read or reread this major text of Karatani's, which is um, a really fascinating work, probably easily his most important work. And we're going to spend a lot of time tonight dissecting that particular text but um yeah i've wanted to introduce karatani to marxists for a long time and i thought tonight we would informally just chat about what we find interesting in his work why we think he's somebody worth reading for sure um and let us start with just sort of a little snapshot of who this guy is so he's Obviously, Japanese Marxists. Gabriel and I are not fluent in Japanese. We're not Japanologists by any stretch. We've only read his work in translation. Um, he actually uh, studied with Derrida. He studied in deconstructionist um, com comparative literature. He studied with Frederick Jameson. Um, the man. <clears throat> yeah, the man. Um, Derrida wrote about uh, Karatani, in fact, and um, but he he actually said something quite interesting in the early '90s, in 1989, as the you know decline of really existing socialism started to take place. He said, "Deconstruction, it was evident to me, uh, became perfectly compatible with uh, post-communist capitalism, and so it lost its uh, it lost its teeth." And it actually had nothing of use for Marxism as such. And he said it was at that point that he started to turn to think about how he might take another look at synthesizing Kant with Marx. And that's his uh, major text, which uh, made him very well known in the West called Trans Critique. Um, Zizek uh, wrote a text called Parallax View, which came out, I think, in 2006, working heavily with uh, that kind of methodology, which we'll, we'll elaborate on in a moment. Um, but in Japan, uh, we, uh, at the end of our workshop we did on him, we had um, a true Japanologist 
um, on with us, who's like an expert on Karatani as well as and, and Marxism too, has done some translation, I think, of Karatani, Gavin Walker. And Gavin said that Karatani is actually like um, a celebrity in Japan, right? Um, at a level which is like, I don't know, huge. Uh, into like the whole dynamics of intellect, public intellectuals are uh, much different there, um, which I found interesting. Um, I also have some gossip about him. So when things get um, boring or hot and heavy, I can throw out maybe some gossip, even though I don't like to do that. But okay. you're right. It's that you're gonna do yeah, it. no, I, I like gossip. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. Um, okay. So, the, okay. That's a little bit about who he is. He, I think it's important to state also, and Gabriel, maybe you could jump in here, is Kozo Uno is an extraordinarily um, path-breaking Marxist from Japan, born in the like 1880s, died in 1973. Um, and so I think he was part of Meiji Restoration. He's just a huge figure, um, experienced the, the, the two wars, uh, saw the rise of Japanese fascism and so on. Um, whereas Karatani is really like a baby boomer, right? Um, although he's obviously a good baby boomer. <laughs> uh, say a little more about who this guy is, if you could, just in general. About who? About Karatani. Ah, okay. I thought I meant Kozono because. The... Oh, that too. That too. Oh, yeah. I'm not qualified to say much about him. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean if we frame. This conversation today, in terms of you know trying to kind of give a good introduction to a specific kind of audience, right? To kind of make a case for Karatani as somebody that Marxists should read, not just the general public, not just philosophers or historians or something, but Marxists. I think that there is something to to be said about uh, the interesting place that he occupies as somebody who is engaged with Western and especially French, uh, you know, philosophy and those critical debates, but who's doing so from a different position. And I'm not sure what you think, but I have the impression that, uh, that this kind of two, two things happen that I find relevant in this, uh, uh, the fact that he has uh, this double kind of background, right? He studied economy uh, and he was a literary critic. Uh, he wasn't very kind of, I mean, he wasn't really uh, groomed to be one of those guys inside a uh, comparative literature department just making references to Marx and French theorists. He had his one of his feet somewhere else. And I, on that level already, I feel like it puts him in a bit of a distrust of what you were talking about in terms of like the, the critical power of certain uh, theoretical procedures that were famous in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And that's one thing. And the other thing is also engaging with that from afar, where certain distinctions that we are so keen to make between like but Deleuze said this, Derrida said that there's this early phase, late phase like we're so like French theory is not only really focused on the text as a metaphor which is something Cartani actually develops but it's also obsessed with the text, right? So re reading right is such a crucial thing and I feel like Cartani doesn't really abide to that. He's Reading his work is a very strange experience of somebody chewing a lot of things you know and showing them to you in a slightly weird way that where some distinctions that are very important to you make no difference to him uh, and other things that you don't really care about suddenly so become like these crucial things. And uh, there's a bit of estrangement there that I find useful. So uh, there is something about his distance and the way that he engages with this material that sometimes I feel does give it a fresh look. Uh, and like I'd say that appears more in his engagement with certain parts of the Western canon of philosophy, especially the way that he will integrate French theory, its stakes on you know, critical thinking and so on. And on the more immediately Marxist side of his thinking, I'd say that 
the experience of fascism in Japan and the idea that that Western fascism isn't, you know, the only type of fascism or it doesn't subsume all fascist experiences and they are all kind of versions of Nazism or something like this. I find this to be relevant as well to the way that he approaches some of the discussions. I mean, two things like the, the, the feudalism capitalism debate, so the transition to capitalism debate, when the scene from Japan, which has a very specific experience of a feudal society, plus the relation to fascism as well, and that distinction. So I feel like he approaches history from a place that sometimes mm. <clears throat> also produces this estrangement mm. and mm. aligns things that we're not used to see in the same order and misaligned things that we are used to see. Exactly. Part of exactly. simpler story. And so I, I, I think that that's, again, trying to frame this as no ways of making Karatani interesting for Marxists. Yeah, you gave the, we gave the name, I don't know if it was you or someone else, I think it was you, the concept of low res. He, he is a low res thinker, uh, especially in the world history text, in the sense that um, he can give you like a kind of a 30,000 foot picture of social processes, which uh, sometimes is quite stunning, especially in the elegance of his mode of writing, which is extraordinarily lucid and not filled with any jargon, which is another reason why it's a bit odd that he does have the deconstructionist training because it doesn't appear in when you read his work in that sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I disagree a bit. And I also, I don't think that we should sell Karatani to the Marxist reader as if he's somebody who dismissed uh, I mean, you, you, you told the story, which I, I remember him saying it somewhere about realizing that now the constructionism is totally aligned, but he's not somebody who's going to make it easy for you to create this ta tale of, you know, liberal postmodern French thinkers versus hardcore real Marxists. Like, that's not how he works. And his first book on Marx was a book, was kind of, premise on the idea that we should learn how to read Marx and that there is a literary kind of procedure to properly mm -hmm. understanding what Marx is talking about that escaped many thinkers. So Marx, the center of possibilities, which is from 73, uh, is very much con concerned with reading the text, right? Mm -hmm. And Karatani will actually claim that all the way to structure of world history, which I now forget if uh, it's published in, in I think it's originally published when? Uh, uh, 2010, sorry. Yeah, so all the way to 2010, from 1973, all the way there, he claims in the preface to Structure of World History that he always, always kind of had this critical, the best he could do is have a critical procedure based on the reading of text. He never produced a systematic account of things, and that's what he was going to try to do, a more prescriptive Thing, right so uh and more creative thing so you yeah. could say that i mean i mean a very serious engagement with structuralism and post-structuralism is kind of in place throughout his work i think that the the way i would present it is that i think it's a very novel synthesis of these two sometimes apparently opposing traditions of structuralism and post-structuralism and this more european based kind of form of, of theory and philosophy and so on and you know marxism he, he he proposes a way of bringing the two together which i think has the amazing quality of setting both against him like a lot of marxists really dislike his work and a lot of you know kind of structuralist post-structuralist philosophers will really hate it as well mm -hmm. uh, so i don't think that he dismisses it completely though I yeah. think, again, at distance he has from these procedures, I think he has, I mean, he's remarkably self-critical. I mean, much more than we are used to, I'd say, like at least the, the I can't really think of, of, a, of a Marxist thinker or a philosopher who engages with this material that, you know, starts hating on 
Hegel and then in structure of world history says, well, but he's the first guy to realize this and that that I didn't care for. Uh, all the way to structure of world history, he hates on Engels. And now we're seeing the new book is coming out, like five chapters on Engels getting things mm. right. Mm. So it's like, he changes his mind a lot. And he makes a lot of kind of self critiques about focusing too much on literary, uh, the critical textual part, and then realizing he had to get out of that. So uh, it's also very refreshing in mm -hmm. that way. <clears throat> I think. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because his, I mean, he puts a huge onus um, on the moment of 1848 as composing uh, like a, the, the modern um, fusion of the three spheres of capital, nation, and state. And he says that it was at that moment that the workers' movement, this goes back to your comment on Engels, he says at that moment, the workers' movement treated the antagonisms of modern capitalism as if they were still in the feudal structure of the master and slave relation, right? Where does he say that? He says it's in trans critique. And he says Marx had a completely different view of the Hegelian dialectic of master slave. And that, in fact, um, this led to a faulty left Ricardian understanding of centralized power and the Engelsian approach, which he's very, very critical of um, all the way through structure of world history. And the book you just mentioned on power is the one that is not yet, it's not yet out, right? Is it out in Japanese or is it is it not yet finished? It is out. It is out. Shout out to Anna, a uh, great comrade who is actually reading the book and relaying some of the info to me. <laughs> mm. Interesting. But anyway, so let's dig into the some of the important important concepts. I think that's good for preliminary kind of a snapshot of who he is. Um, yeah, I just say before we move to like complicated conceptual stuff, like uh, I just wanted to mention two things. The first is, I mean, I'm just thinking about this now, but it, it always kind of haunts me a bit because, you know, there, we have interesting parallels between his position with regards to French, like the heritage of French theory uh, and Brazil. In Brazil, we have a guy called Roberto Schwartz, who it's not very well known as a kind of South American Marxist around the world, but he's a very, very interesting figure, very crucial figure in our kind of critical theory. Uh, and he, I, I always think that Caratani shares a lot of uh, interesting characteristics with the, that particular Brazilian group of thinkers who also looks at capitalism from a slightly awry position, like from a slight skew position and... Uh, also managed to make that connection between liter uh, literary criticism and cap uh, analysis, readings of capital, but then moving towards a more social theory that that for some reason was very sensitive, very attentive to a sort of stratification of capitalist logic, where you don't want to simply treat it as a unitary logic. Uh, both this Brazilian strand, which today has been developed under the title of peripherization thesis, uh, and the Japanese Karatani approach, both share, I think, these two traits. The first is kind of the lack of self-grandeur that sometimes makes Western analysis of capitalism forget that capitalism emerged in a kind of marginal place. It didn't emerge at the core of everything. So there is a very, very particular relation between periphery and capitalism, which I think Caratani also pursues. And on the other hand, both have the similarity of, uh, for example, Schwarz will talk about capitalism in Brazil and capitalist ideology in Brazil as, as the logic of ideas out of place, where the actual ground that organizes social relations and the values of liberal market economy, they don't match. And you get like this misaligned structure. So, but to talk about misalignment, you need to talk about levels and kind of layers, right? And that idea of different logics that you need to arrange together, they don't come in a package that's homogeneous. That's also very crucial to Karatani. So 
I find it interesting to see that, I mean, I don't think Brazil and Japan are the only places to have produced that particular type of analysis, but it's interesting to see that the further we go from the kind of axis of, you know, uh, classic, I don't know if you want to call it like this, Marxist analysis, like European, American, and so on, the more you get out of it, the, the clearer it is that this heterogeneity and this kind of polymorphous aspect of capitalist sociality is something that you need to account for right from the beginning, you know? Mm. So, I don't know, I find that also an interesting thing uh, about his work. Just before, also before we move to his concepts, but I think it's also a, in the guise of an introduction to that. You mentioned Cosa Uno and I didn't say anything. And uh, what I can say, which I, I think it's quite, quite clear from Caratani's own use of his work, is that uh, I feel like there is, you know, Uno is known for, for that big book on the pure theory of capital, right? Where the word pure, I think, gets a lot of people annoyed or already with a kind of bad impression of it. But it's interesting to see this sort of interesting unfolding the theory of, of capital as if it is, a, it has its internal logic, which is not exactly the same logic as, it, as the logic of capital once instantiated in a concrete, you know, uh, multi kind of uh, uh, determined real situation, right? That kind of distinction, I feel like it's used in a, once it's taken up in structure of world history by Caratani in his theory of the modes of intercourse, uh, it actually leads to a very weird uh, and very novel approach to what social logics are. And I mean, we can get to it as we go, but I, I would say that not only is his relation to Cosa Uno, he mentions Cosa Uno quite often, quite often in Trans Critique, in the uh, beginning of Trans Critique, I think just gives credence to the idea that Marxism is, has been alive and well uh, in many schools in Japan, and that this kind of rich environment is very relevant for Karatani. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, it's an interesting thing to see this, this particular line of theory that you get with Uno and these theorists of, let's analyze the sort of abstracted, pure logic, uh, how it will connect, strangely enough, with phenomenology in, and uh, Russell mm. and, mm. and that, that line of uh, thinking, which is a yeah. strange kind of thing to, yeah. to find. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but we can get to that later on. Yeah, even, even also the notion he gets from Uno, as far as I understand, of course, is that you could say it an anti-teleological notion, which he discovers quite early on in some ways. Uh, that Mar the novelty of Marx's capital is not found in the inevitability of revolution, but is found in, in the, ci the cycles of crisis. Um, that's what's uh, interesting also against, I think, perhaps a lot of Western Marxism. Um, and the other one is that, of course, he's huge on saying to historical materialism, the tradition of historical materialism, which insisted on the autonomy of the cultural sphere or the superstructural sphere um, as somehow possibly eligible to be not determined by the logic of capital. I, I feel that Uno also uh, disputes that uh, in, in some ways, although I'm not as familiar or fluent with Uno to say uh, for sure, but those are the common, those are the common references you see to him uh, that Karatani picks up on. And I think, um, the other one, of course, is his insights into, sur into surplus value are huge and value theory is huge, um, where he makes an interesting point that actually um, uh, I realize he says, I realize that it's um, the real epistemological break is in Marx's discoveries uh, around the Grundrisse time. It's not in German ideology, as Althusser says, right, which we can talk about all that, but um, yeah. Uh, shall we then dive in? Um, maybe it would be useful actually to start about what Karatani's theory is, um, starting perhaps with trans critique 
or or actually maybe even going back to architecture as metaphor might even make a little more sense. It's such an interesting text. Um, mm -hmm. What would you prefer? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I I, I really think that uh, this this story needs to be told like with all the chapters because. Uh, it's it's the way that uh, you know from perhaps the earlier part is a bit more complicated because when when we, like the first Marxist text that we have by Caratani, even though he was, if I understand correctly, he was already a uh, he already won like prizes in Japan for his literary criticism and so on, and in this kind of context, he publishes. This first book, Marx, the center, like the first book on Marxism, Marx, the center of his possibilities, which is very, which has two theses which I find like central. The first is that, uh, I mean, which is the least interesting, honestly. It's like, let's, we need to reread Marx. You know, let's take all these kind of tools from, you know, uh, the reading techniques, the critical reading techniques that you know, French theory and so on. Let's reread Marx and we'll understand what's really at stake there. I mean, everyone was doing that at the time. But what he does that it's really new, and again, it's an interesting thing to wonder how much it, it is uh, a product both of, both of having, let's say, he's not a literary critic because he's a philosopher, like a lot of us, you know, who go to comparative literature departments to study philosophy, he was actually a prize-winning literary critic. So he was interested in literature and linguistics for their own sake, I, I guess. And when he when it comes to applying the so-called you know, reading methods to or deconstructionist methods or whatever to reading Marx, he doesn't do what I think a lot of uh, structuralists did to Marx, uh, which is to first filter their understanding of Saussure uh, through philosophy and then apply Saussure and apply structural linguistics to Marx, he actually does the inverse. He, he, I, I try, I'm trying to remember the exact quote. I might even have it here. Uh, there is a point where he, he says quite clearly like uh, that we can understand Saussure a bit better if we follow what Marx is proposing. So he, he gets a quote from from chapter two of the first volume of Capital, where Marx says that value appears in between two communities uh, because we exchange what's, let's say, the, the, the surplus of one, com one community's production with another. And he says, well, you see this idea that value appears in between two systems. That's the concept of value for Saussure. And he rereads Saussure through Marx first, which I don't think is the usual structuralist procedure. First, you define structure as a differential system, and then you look at differences to understand Marx. And what is Marx as a differential thinker where commodities are just differences with regards to other commodities? He does the inverse. He takes the concept of value in Marx to be the core one. And then he reads Saussure, and he says, well, therefore, we have a problem because difference as a value uh, is, not a, is not something that happens inside a system. It's what, it, what appears in between systems. So you will see the problem of the signifier when you think about translation between two languages, for example. In, under the condition that there is no total language, right, to guarantee. So he already frames the problem of different signification, always in this idea that you have more than one system and that you're looking at a sort of uh, displacement between them. And it's that moment that you need to ask, what is invariant when I move from one system to another, that something emerges that requires structuralism as a form of thought. It's actually much more aligned to Le with Levi-Strauss in a certain sense, and it gives up, gives kind of an interesting reading of Saussure if you were, were to pursue this discussion further. But it shows that he was first committed to Marx, and then he was going to use Marx as a key to read a sort of core structuralist text. So that's already a slightly singular position. And I have the impression that it takes him from 1973 all the way to 
uh, 81 when he, he releases, which are actually kind of loose texts brought together, which under the title of architecture as a metaphor, it kind of takes him that time to make a more thorough critique of the paradigm of criticism and, and kind of analysis that was part of the structuralist uh, uh, approach, which he actually makes a very nice distinction. He doesn't really talk about structuralism. He criticizes what he calls the textual metaphor. He says, uh, up until a point in philosophy, everything was an architecture. And in Marxism included, we had this sort of base and superstructure, everything like the foundations are the essential. The surface is the appearance, multiplicity. It's always, let's say, ephemeral. We need to get back to basis, back to the basics and so on. And thinking would be moving from multiplicity down to the one. Move, moving from otherness, which is appearance, down to unity, which is essential, right? And he says, well, for many, many reasons, the 20th century moved away from this kind of metaphor of surface and ground or, you know, up top where things are accidental, contingent, kind of irrelevant and down low when they're fundamental, move away from that towards a more uh, kind of an inverted metaphor even, which he calls a textual metaphor. And it's clear that he's talking above all about this French kind of milieu, which is like championed this idea, right? Where now you have the inverse. The surface is the truth. The surface is the, where the real is at stake. So at the level of multiplicity, the level of, ambiguity, that's, let's say, where the closest to something fundamental. And going down to the depths, going towards meaning, signification, the fantasy of ground, the fantasy of unit, that's always the contingent, the illusory, the dangerous part. So thought is going up and sticking to the surface, where you have multiplicity, singularity, otherness, and so on. And, and he formulates what I think is like one of the coolest, most brilliant ways of describing this shift between architectural and textual, only to claim, yeah, this thing is very limited and I don't want to stick to that. So you can see that there is a problem with this idea of surface for him, but there is a problem with the idea of architecture as this idealized metaphor of an edifice. And he proposed a sort of return to architecture, but he says no longer the ideal architecture, but the secular architecture. He, he quotes in passing a text by uh, Edward Said called the secular other, where he says, these guys in Europe now, they're obsessed with this kind of fantasized, mystified idea of otherness, as if it's like an absolute thing. You never get there. It's always irreducible. Every French thinker has its figure of the absolute other, absolute creativity, absolute difference, or whatever you want. Uh, but actual otherness in the world is always the encounter of two systems which you cannot translate one into the other perfectly, but there's also nothing hidden, right? And he talks about, he makes this nice move. He says, Plato founded supposedly this idea of an ideal architecture as a metaphor for thinking, uh, but he wasn't a real architecture ar architect. If he were, he would know that Architecture is all about negotiating with another about what they want and also building something that, you know, resists the passage of time. That kind of secular, real activity, concrete activity of architecture is a much better metaphor for thinking uh, than both the ideal of architectural metaphor and textual metaphor. The, the type of difference that appears in this kind of problem of executing a plan, like a blueprint, and knowing that contingency enters the picture, but at the same time, you should execute a plan nonetheless, right? I find that a really nice kind of revigorating kind of approach. It says, of course, we need to go back to constructive thinking, but what, what was lacking, what, the problem was not the constructive part. The problem was our very idealized idea, uh, idealized uh, notion of what construction means. Construction is contingency. Construction is not essence, right? So it, you see that idea from uh, Marx's Center of Possibilities about let's read structuralism under the light of this encounter of multiple systems that don't really translate into one another. And that's where the concept of difference should appear. It, tr it appears more as a kind of, it becomes a very basis of a model for what thought is 
by architecture as metaphor. And this kind of tripartite model of idealized construction, then the sort of in-between moment of reading as a model, interpreting as a model, to then, which is kind of, let's say, a kind of impotent attempt of Western thought in the late 20th century to accept contingency into thought. Contingency of reading, contingency of meaning, contingency of, of fantasy and depth, right? But then to move away to reinstating contingency inside of construction. So you get a sort of, I mean, he hates Plato, at least at that time. And I guess by reading his recent work, you can see he still doesn't like Plato very much. But you get a kind of pragmatic Plato, like a like an idea of construction, an idea that there is, like, there are bases for building things that we plan and so on. But what you actually, the way to do this is uh, it will increase contingency. It will increase the number of impasses and so on. So, so two really important references at that time. One is the famous uh, architect, uh, Christopher Alexander, who has, like, some very Platonist books, like, the timeless way of building or language of patterns or things like this, where he takes a very generative approach to form, where you want, you, the more, the purer the form, the more it is generative of mistakes that you then include in this kind of self, kind of, like, kind of has a bit of a cybernetic feel to it. That, and the other is a, a very interesting engagement with mathematics and, and, and mathematical logic and trying to show that what guys like Derrida wanted, which was to reveal contingency that was being suffocated by form, that's actually what form produces. Like, so you don't need to be afraid of constructive formal approaches to politics or to thinking, because that's, let's say, the secular version of this, the non-idealized version of form and construction is precisely how you get contingency to play a bigger part. Mm. Uh, so that, I think that's that's why you need to tell the story by including these two books. And when we get to Trans Critique, which is uh, 2001, right? So a good other more than 10 years between architecture and metaphor and, and it. Uh, then I think you have, okay, this, you develop a robust approach to how to deal with structure in a way that's not, let's say, uh, you know, derivative of this critical textual tradition. And now you're going to try to re return to this canon that goes from Descartes and Kant, Freud and Marx, because those are the main authors. And even Kierkegaard, he, he, he kind of takes on like a really core kind of line of thinker, Western thinkers in, in French critique. And he's going to give us a complete different view of all of them together culminating, but also starting with Marx, right? So he reads like Karatan, uh, reads uh, Kierkegaard's idea of a fatal leap. It's very mm -hmm. crucial for his work. And he talks about Descartes, uh, how does the cogito appear? And he gives us, again, a kind of theory of the cogito from uh, uh, the experience of traveling, which again, connects us back to that point, right? Because Descartes traveled around, he, he, and he says it himself in the meditations. That's kind of what brings up the idea. Like, I can see that these cultures are different from mine in absolutely heterogeneous ways. So what is not changing? Like, how can I, how can I spell out the thing which doesn't change when I vary so much from one system to another? So that old idea reappears now. Right. So that idea from Marx, the center of possibility, which said, like, we define value by a certain translation at the border between communities, reappears as transcendental, modern transcendental thinking appears when we need to concern ourselves with a move between two cultures and mm -hmm. ask ourselves mm -hmm. what is the same in the other. Right. Uh, it's both very intuitive. Because I mean, you can you can present this experience to anyone, and, may, and it makes sense to ask this question, right? Uh, and also uh, very intuitive and kind of innovative. That's not really how how we approach this thing. So he makes like an interesting story connecting uh, 
uh, you know, social conditions in ancient Greece, the place of commerce, the role of uh, of the past, the, the, uh, the political situation where strangers were much more kind of involved in certain parts of the ancient Greek, like Ionia and smaller part in Athens, to say that this is relevant for the posing of the question of reason, right? Because yeah. you have the stranger, you end up asking the question of, okay, but what is common to these right. two systems? Mm. Then again, in modern times with Descartes and then with Kant, which against the grain, he reads through both things. First, he says, just because Kant never left his town doesn't mean he wasn't sens sensible to, sensitive to travel and the problem of the existence of multiple cultures and how to square this. Mm. Uh, and also the Kant's writing on Swedenborg uh, and, the, and the fact that, you know, in the, I'm not sure how it's called in English, the visions of a dream something, something. How is the Kant's book on Swedenborg called? Yeah, the dream one. It's, um, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's on Swedenborg, is that right? I didn't know that. Dreams of a spirit here. Yeah. Uh, in that book, uh, that's where you find the idea of the, the mention to parallax. Right. After after making this remark that uh, one, one is able to put oneself in the place of the other and at the same time recognize that everything is different about the other's experience, but something remains the same. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to place myself in their position. Karatani picks up that passage and says, well, and, and Kant uses the expression parallax to talk about this shift. I change my place and it's like a pronounced parallax where I realize mm. that objects, everything changes position as I change my subjective position. Nonetheless, something is invariant in that transformation, right? Uh, he picks up that and says, see this again, the same idea of a displacement between systems giving rise to the question of something transcendental that stays the same. And he says, this is, let's say, the, the essential structuralist insight. Mm. So you can see this kind of running across his whole kind of system. And he will read this. I, and, and I find this amazing because he then goes into his discussion of uh, Marx. He, so we kind of go full circle. He says... He gives us all of this and says, you know, this Kantian insight into the parallax, into the transcendental structure. He says, yeah, you know the guy who thought this the best? Marx. And he says, well, if you want, the place you can find this in Marx is, and I'm not sure if he found this afterwards or if this was, an, was a, uh, something that informed his reading. But he brings up, I think in a footnote, but I find this, I always found this amazing. He found a footnote by... Paul Valéry, no, it's not a footnote. He found a, a letter by Paul Valéry that he quotes in a footnote where Valéry is telling a friend, you know, I think I'm the only guy in France that read the three volumes of Capital. And one of the basic insights from reading it is that it is obvious that there is no uh, link between production and consumption. That there is a gap between how things are produced and how they are consumed on the other end. Uh, and this gap... Is not, you cannot eliminate it. And then Valéry goes into the idea that, well, this has a consequence for artists, aesthetic production. You shouldn't, the logic of production shouldn't be concerned with the logic of consumption of art or reception because there is a gap, whatever. But he makes this claim. And Karatani goes back to this and says, well, this is the core of the two systems that don't really uh, coincide and that you need to leap between. Right? He will then focus and kind of expand Marx's analysis of the moment just after writing the expanded formula for capital. You have money that buys labor power, buys means of production, produces a commodity. So that's the production side of it. Three little dots. The commodity is sold for more money. Those three little dots there represent the moment that you take the commodity, which is already produced, and you need to make it consumed. It needs to be bought by somebody. And in that moment, he says, well, this is a place that there is a gap and it needs to be bridged, right? 
and it needs to be breached in a particular, like uh, you need to kind of be able to cross this gap in a, under a certain conditions, right? And at that moment, you can see value as the thing that needs to be preserved between the two. So right, but it's not, but it's not visible to the actors within the. It's in, it's a, effectively invisible. But you see how it then becomes clearer. The idea yeah, yeah, that yeah, from yeah. the standpoint of producing something, yeah, you don't see it. You only see the use value from the standpoint of consumption. You only see the use value. But in between these two moments, mm. the thing that translates the invariance is value. Right. Well, you have a transcendental theory of value. So he says, uh, in this in this sense, Marx has a transcendent a theory of something transcendental with a very precise modern, and then you can argue whether Kantian or not sense, mm -hmm. right? So because, yeah, yeah. You, I just wanted to point there, this full circle, right? Yeah. Idea. The difference there that he is very fond of drawing out, not I mean he mentions it um, uh, a little bit in Structure of World History, but he mentions it a lot is Ricardo. And that it was Ricardo's position that, in fact, that is visible. And it's through exploitation that this moment uh, is evident. And he says, um, this goes back to the critique of aspects of Marxists who didn't read Capital adequately enough. And um, it also shows that thing I was saying before about his theory of conflict within capitalism, in some sense. Um, because exploitation is not um, the root there. I mean, he has a theory of exploitation for sure. But I was wondering if you could say something more about that. I was always struck by this uh, critique of Ricardo because he says that Marx um, had uh, awoken from his dogmatic slumber um, through the engagement of um, the other economist who is never mentioned at all. Samuel Bailey. Bailey, yeah. And that Bailey is basically the one who made Marx understand this quasi-Kantian transcendental uh, moment, that this is the, the theory of surplus value that Marx is arriving at, uh, or allowed, allowed the proper distinction between um, absolute and relative surplus value theory. Yeah, I think that, I mean, if I recall the way that he makes the analogy, he says... Uh, Ricardo is to Leibniz as Bailey is to Hume. So, it, it with, and Marx is Kant. So, you get on the one hand Ricardo saying something like, you know, money is like a accidental, illusory thing. Exchange value is actually inherent in the commodity, and then that that would be, let's say, the a sort of rationalist account, mm. uh, kind of almost like a pre-modern understanding of a sort of rational subject you know like it's the reason is embedded in this thing and mm -hmm. then you get Hume saying well but the more conventionalist take on relationalist also take on on reason and so on and Bailey would do something similar for value as saying well but, but wait a second actually value is only exists in relation to other com commodities but a kind of relativist take and then you get both of the antinomy right is exchange value in the commodity or in the relation between commodities in a sort of conventionalist sense. And Marx would solve this antinomy by showing that it's both and neither in a similar yeah. way that reason will be taken up by Kant as being both, let's say, not in a, you know, a, a immediate faculty we, we have as, you know, under our power, so to speak, but also mm -hmm. not just a convention, a set of customs, or something like this. So, mm -hmm. if I if I recall correctly, that's that's where it appears. But I, it follows from this a theory of different takes on surplus, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, it, it, you will find it there. The sort of uh, account as well. Uh, it's weird for me because. Mm, the way that he, I don't recall exactly, like if I, I'm, I'm afraid that if I go into, let's say, the way he develops the theory of surplus uh, in Transcritique, I might misconstrue like the core of it. Like I can even try to open it here, just if I can recall like the way that he uh, presents it, because uh,
I mean, it, it is the it is you're you're right in saying that there's something that goes directly from this to uh, his theory of uh, you know like not theory but his kind of political strategizing because right. trans critique ends with a kind of counterintuitive idea at least for some and for some like a heretical idea that well if his theory is correct uh, under the reign of relative surplus value uh, which is let's say what's truly singular about capitalism right you, you get uh, extraction of absolute surplus meaning having workers work more hours so in this way that's conditioned right uh, the rate of value production per hour is fixed so if you want more value you need from workers you need them working more time you're not changing the rate itself uh, well the moment that you have fully developed capitalist societies what what uh, Cartani suggests is that the core place for for interventions no longer is the factory no longer is the site of production because with automation and so on the rate of how many workers you need changes so drastically that you can have very let's say labor uh, not, not so intensive uh, uh, labor intensive places of, of work that you have power there necessarily but this moment of connection between the, the, the side of production and the side of consumption. So the boycott, right? The interruption of circulation mm. would be mm. a crucial place uh, for intervention. And it is based on this idea that, well, capitalists have not realized surplus value until the moment that commodities are sold and bought in the market for more money. Uh, it, it, so making sure he criticizes the idea that surplus value is in the commodity, and not in the commodity that is then sold. Right. It's crucial to show that there is an extra step missing and that you can mm -hmm. intervene there and challenge capitalist power, right? Yeah, uh, in other words, in other words, um, I always thought that he would be very admiring if he's aware, I'm sure he is, of like this notion of the IWW, this very famous, I don't know if you're familiar with them. In, they're still around, but they had their heyday during the second international period in the United States. And their philosophy was... You one... mean the industrial workers of the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Their, their, their philosophy was, in a way, very much interested in combining the worker as understanding that um, they're sold back their consumption as a precondition of their labor. It's not a separate relation. In fact... Um, Karatani will say in the structure of world history later that even you could say from a Kantian ethical standpoint, it's actually uh, better for workers to think of agitation to capitalism at both the site of consumption, maybe even more so today after revolutions in capitalism, such as Keynesianism and the welfare state, which Marx didn't necessarily account for or in, in, as much. Uh, precisely because their autonomy um, is is more enhanced than it is at the job place. So in that sense, it's not that he's against productivist or worker-based, factory-based struggle. No, he's for the kind of unification of that with consumer tactics of revolt and resistance at the same time. You want, you want I, I just say mind. something which I think also needs to be clarified, which is, you know, consumer tactics... I think it's also, I mean, I don't think he wrote this in a time that this had become so clear, but you know, you know, the, what's the name of that big ship that got stuck on mm. the channel in the, like the Nile or the, in Egypt or the recently, like yeah. two years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 I forget the name. We of should the know the name of that heroic, uh, what's the name of that, uh, the Suez Canal. Suez Canal, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, everyone should know the canal obstruction of 2021. Yes. What was the name of the of the ship? But anyway, somebody could, somebody could chat it if they could find it out. But anyways. Yeah. Uh, ever given. Amazing. Perfect. Uh, well, if you know, an our moment, you look at that, it's a way of, you know, it got in the way of you know, 
worldwide logistics and circulation of commodities. You wouldn't call that a consumer. Product. Right, right. And that perfectly fits what he's talking about. So Caratelli is not talking about, cons because, I mean, honestly, like consumption is, I think most Marxists that here is talking here will say, okay, but consumption is not the opposite of production, right? Con production is consumption. It's called productive right. consumption. So uh, consumption is not the contrary of production. Circulation is more the contrary. And so far as circulation is essentially committed to preserving the value until it gets exchanged for money, right? So the three dots is expanded into a huge circuit. I mean, if you think of the idea of the container as this sort of machine for abstracting a object from the world and keeping its value preserved, right? Like the window shop is also the sort of freezer of value, right? You want to make sure that between the thing arrives and somebody buys it, that its value is preserved. Mm. Because just a passage of time would make its use value go down mm. as it gets corrupted by the world. And then you would sell it for less than mm. you cost to it. So the world of circulation in that particular sense, that's more of what he's focusing sure. on. It's not Absolutely. about consumer strategies and so on. And I mean, although, although it's it is although with that play a role. That, right? that does, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're, you're right. I mean, this is, um, we, we kind of need to kind of go back to begin to to carve out the structure of world history and the kind of domains and especially the Kant's innovation because Kant is so significant and this he's not the first Marxist Carthani is not the first Marxist to make the claim that Kant should be seen as a godfather of of so modern socialism but the important point is that Kant did not live in the era of the same form of capitalism that Marx experienced. He lived in the era of merchant capitalism. And in that era, Caratani says that Kant is the figure who developed um, the solution for the proper overcoming in that particular situation um, through the theory of cosmopolitanism and through his politi political writings and his ethical writings. And Caratani, by the way, makes an interesting point, which is... Um, at the moment of 1989, he was awoken from his dogmatic slumber of deconstructionism by reading different. It was interesting that new readings of Kant were emerging at that time. And he references like um, Hannah Arendt and others. But anyways, he saw something there. And I think Lucian Goldman is the other Marxist who's pretty well known, not as a neo-Kantian, which I think is an important distinction we could make in a moment. But as trying to preserve something which is maybe more authentic or originary to Kant as such, right? It's not. Um, it's so. Could you could you say something about his Kantianism in relationship to this kind of radical um, notion of associationism? Ultimately, what Kant discovered. Yeah, so let me just explain, right? Since we're again introducing to people, because you just jumped so quickly. Like, so Karatani will say from that thing we were talking about that. There is this moment of conversion, right, of, let's say, potential surplus to actual, the selling of commodities and the realization of surplus as profit and so on, uh, that their moment is a moment of intervention that is more structural than the strike as a side of production. The strike Correct. as a side of production can be, you know, under certain circumstances, it might be kind of made neutralized. It might be neutralized by, by particular forms of uh, capitalist organization, but the moment in circulation wouldn't be. So we should start paying attention to it. Then you mentioned like, yeah, it's not in, it's not being against the productive. I, I, I think he, again, I think he doesn't care about that debate. Like he's not saying shit about what others are doing. He's just saying, pay attention to this as well. Right? I agree. I agree. That said, uh, he goes a step further and he says, well, the moment that you, because he's not a moral, the moment that you break the circuit of commodities. People who need those commodities won't get them. So in, in tandem with doing this, one should develop alternative forms of production that can feed the communities that are left without the commodities. 
Mm. Not only that, but the way that these exchanges should happen should itself be mediated by different currencies. So he develops a complex scheme of different apparatuses that should go together, both critical and in terms of interventions that interrupt things, but also things that are set in motion. And he proposes this thing he calls the associationist movement based on this complex kind of composite of strategies, right? Strategies at the level of interruption of logistics, strategies at the level of creation of cooperatives and developing of small producers that can, you know, serve populations, but also strategies for the development of local currency. He was very much kind of enamored of Michael Linton's project, uh, LATS, right? Let's. Local exchange trading systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and he, he says, look, these things could go together, right? And he's also an internationalist as well, in the sense that um, part of the logic of um, what Kant discovers is an ethical imperative, which is in complete concert with Marx's notion of the future, of what would, what would be beyond capitalism. He says Kant actually thinks the beyond of capitalism more adequately than Marx did because Marx was trying to solve something different. And he says, and I think it's obvious that Marx and Engels had very little to say about what the future would be, but Kant actually gives that. And furthermore, the utopian socialists and the anarchists, Produn and Stirner, actually experimented with this in Paris Commune, right? Right. They, they are the ones that innovated, um, what a form of life of association might look like that's not dictated by the dominance of commodity exchange, right? Yeah, so uh, on that, uh, we're, I mean, hopefully you can get a bit more into it once we lay it out, like, because French Critique is this kind of last book of a certain series, and it opens a space for this big, big opus structure of world history where he systematizes some of these ideas much clearer. So at this point, I, I feel like both the, the theoretical work he's doing with trans critique and the, the militant work he's doing, because it's at the time that he develops this new associationist movement. Uh, I feel like you get a couple of things that I wouldn't focus so much, especially because they don't return exactly in the same way afterwards. So I think they're a bit more contingent than it looks. The first one is that uh, he already plays with this idea of a how do you say this word? Associationism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at that point, and he develops a, a kind of practical view of how this should look. Practically, it has to do with what we're talking about. Strategies of boycott, development of new com communities of production, new means of exchange uh, between people, philosophically, because trans critique is already framed like you need a theory of value based on a transcendental reading, because you cannot treat value as either being embedded nor being just relational in a conventionalist sense. So you can locate this mortal fatal leap of the commodity, otherwise it would disappear. Uh, you need this transcendental theory of value. With this, we're establishing a dialogue with Kant. So he takes this dialogue as far as he can. So he makes a bunch of analogies like Bailey is to Hume, uh, Marx is to Kant, and then uh, he develops like a, a shows that Kantian ethics is very socialistic because to treat the person always as an end in themselves, never as a means. It's kind of antagonistic with labor power as a commodity. Uh, because then people are reduced to a means, the means of a uh, special type of means of production, right? Uh, so on and so forth. But now, I and, and he goes as far as analyzing like Kant's text on cosmopolitanism, uh, Kant's kind of dubious relation with nations and the, what would supersession, supersession of nations look like and so on. And he will follow this line of thinking and generalize it to a point because if in transcriptic Kant is kind of this beacon that shows that there is a seed of something interesting for socialist thinking in philosophy, in modern philosophy. Uh, and again, if you go back to the earlier work that he did, you can see the similar gist, which is to say, you guys want to throw away a tradition that there's something there in this constructive type of thinking. 
-hmm. just need to be secular and pragmatic and kind of real about it, you know, in, in embedded in a more contingent kind of environment rather than dismiss it in favor of something which ultimately will be more idealistic. So there is this constant recuperation of this canon. Uh, and in trans critique, it's clearly focused on Kant. But when you move further, you will see like it's all these philosophers, you know, rereading from ancient Greece and, and philosophy would be essentially connected to socialism to some point. I think that, uh, I mean, personally, I'm not that interested in the argument is Kant, you know, per, anticipating something relevant for socialism. I, I mean, it, I find Karatani so creative in his readings of everyone uh, that he's clearly not the reader of Kant to the letter of Kant. No. If he manages to show that there is a socialist Kant, that's to the merit of Karatani, not to the merit of Kant. I have the impression Karatani could do this to anyone he, he pleased, you know, because of the particular way he does things. Like, I just don't want this and I don't find it that productive. Uh, if I, I find Karatani's commitment ultimately is to socialism and uh, he will do as he pleases with a certain tradition and make it fit with his multiple ways of reading. I don't think there's a fundamental commitment to Kant. And I find that there are very few ideas you can only understand in Karatani if you understand Kant. And I think most Kantian scholars would actually be both amused by his reading of Kant because Karatani is generally a good reader of people. He reads them in a nice way. He's charitable and so on. But also a bit kind of, you know, like, come on. Yeah, I mean, this is the big thing I, I discovered when I presented Karatani to American Kantian scholars, where you'll remember in Structure of World History, um, he says the most important modern or like highly contemporary um, political philosopher working in the Kantian tradition is John Rawls. But John Rawls misread Kant because he thought that Kant was actually putting forward a theory of um, a distribution-based model for the achievement of the Kantian kingdom of ends, right? But uh, in associationism, which of course he does make the proper footnotes and the proper argumentation to show that Kant did identify empirical examples of real um, early socialist associationist movements in his own time and use those as the scaffolding by which his theory of cosmopolitanism was developed. So I think, therefore, that especially when you deal with American philosophy, academic philosophers that are analytic, that are trained in Rawlsian Kantianism, it's actually... I think important to stake down more of this argument that here's another way to read Kant that he opens up for us because there is a sincere um, Kantian studies contribution that Karatani could make um, for also the cause of socialism, I would say, because it, it means something very different to talk about um, the efficacy of Kantian ethics within capitalism than after you read what Karatani does to Kant. You know what I mean? Because he has this whole thing that actually Kantian associationism is the best solution for the dissolution of the state. And that Kant is fundamentally an anti-statist thinker, right? Um, and that um, none of his ethical vision is even feasible within a world dominated by merchant capital or by more sophisticated capital that Marx experienced. I think these things are are worth uh, retaining. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, is there any serious philosopher whose vision of ethics would be realizable under market and state power? I mean, well, those are liberal, liberal Kantians uh, act no, as if. No, as that's a reading. Blah blah blah. I mean, it's just it that is. like some of these statements are very general. That they would apply to many philosophers. Like, it's. it's I don't see the. I mean. Again, putting my cards on the table. Generally, my reading of Karatani, as we will also be able to develop a bit further in a bit, uh, it's one of the things I try to be quite prudent about is that even though Karatani makes very interesting and novel uses of 
philosophy. I think that because he, I find that he doesn't care much about it. Like Karatani will be the last person to say, therefore, we should teach more philosophy. You know, that will help us. Like, it's not what he's saying. Uh, but I think that there can be a reading of him where it seems like philosophers are doing this great socialist work that I don't think that he's implying. Right. And like Kant did not solve socialist problems by writing books sitting at his house. It's only because Karatuan is already considering like this huge tradition of things that came after and that were happening at the political level that he's able to provide this reading that nobody who read Kant without these other commitments was able to provide. So, yes, we can make statements of that sort, but just like with Saussure, he produces the reading of structure as this differential thing from his engagement with Marx and other kind of variables we're not private to. Mm -hmm. Why was Kalatani that read it this way? I think the similar thing is happening now to Kant. He's going mm -hmm. to Kant. He's fundamentally committed to this kind of shifting perspective between communities through which the transcendental appears in the middle. He picks out a, a, you know, those thinkers that kind of help him develop this. And the strong, the foothold of the analogy is in Marx, not in Kant. So it's not that Marx is like Kant. He's more showing that Kant is more like Marx than we thought. But ultimately, the, the, the strong place which he uses, the, the kind of the meter or the standard he uses to evaluate is not Kant got things right. Let's see how much Marx also gets them right. Is that Marx got most things right. Let's see how much of it Kant also got. Of course, these things are never like pure parallels. Sometimes by doing this, Kant shines a clearer light on some things, but that it's never about Kant, you know, mm -hmm. to the point that this is dismissed and it's not really the way he will an analyze things later. And I think that this is a crucial thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he writes this in 2001. Again, 10 years, nine years later, he comes out with the structure of world history and Kant plays a very new role. It's no longer a model for thinking in general for the mm -hmm. transcendental, but the, the sort of logics are now called modes of intercourse. Yeah. Uh, are modes and not a, the transcendental of value, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we no longer have this idea of two systems that you go from one to another. You have the idea of a tripartite structure and oh, it says, right. yeah, we get a much better picture with Hegel and we need a theory of history, which is something we didn't get in Kant. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not that committed to this. I, I would enough. place him in the position of Kantian Marxist. Like, yeah, it's no, secondary. Sure. It's secondary, but I'm using it only to um, push um, American liberals who have a very particular reading of Kant that they think is antagonistic to. Kantian socialism. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's an interesting debate. I, 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 no, 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 totally peripheral. All right. No, but let, okay. Beautiful. And yes, I mean, there are like a number of proper names, like Hobbes, like there are, there are, um, proper names in the history of philosophy that Karatani brings in for their discoveries, which are highly idiosyncratic to the construction of his philosophical project. And we can we can talk about some of those some of those names, um, but maybe could we um, could we talk about the modes, perhaps? Mm -hmm. it, it seems like a good time. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's the right place to do it because uh, it's interesting. Like you get this analysis in. I mean, he already does this by the end of Transcritique. The end of Transcritique, he he. He makes a very strong analysis at the end of it saying like, which I, I find like that is very productive of showing, you know, if there is this kind of gap, this moment of possible inconsistency in the circuit of surplus realization, of course, capitalism will try to develop structures to bridge it more consistently. And well, if you try to blockade a street, the police appears really quickly because the state is very much concerned with preventing surplus from not realizing itself. So there, there are, let's say, ob uh, social objects or social uh, apparatuses or whatever you want to call them that intervene 
At that moment, for example, to guarantee the, the circuit of uh, surplus realization to complete itself, but they are not necessarily part of the process of production themselves. They are, for example, the police. So he, he starts looking into the way that, for example, the logic of the state integrates itself in the logic of capital, even though they're separate, but they are also, let's say, helping this gap to get stitched together, right? And he finishes the book by kind of analyzing the way that nation state and capital stitch each other in this way, right? So it's already a merit of Transcritique to show the, the, the logic of capital, A, from this kind of very singular idea of, of a transcendental point of view, which is a historical, not subjective, it's not about you know, your subjective, it's not how capital appears to you that makes it transcendental. You know, it's not because we are cognitively structured this way. It's transcendental in the precise sense that it is invariant under transformations, right? Value is transcendental because it is, let's say, framing a process and in a way that this frame determines something about that process and not in the sense that me as a cognitive agent have categories that structure my kind of subjective existence in such a way that cannot but perceive value. It's not about that, right? So the first singular point is this, this idea of, well, there are social logics that are objective, in the sense that they frame a process, they are framing our very experience of something contingent, but at the same time, they are historical, so they're not outside of time, they're not, let's say, constitutive of our uh, cognition but they are constitutive of our social cognition, perhaps we could say. And on the other hand, to present it in such a way that the role of other social logics are clearer. Because the moment that you make this kind of steps in the process of production, circulation, and consumption, and expanded reproduction, so on, clearer, it's clear that there are gaps, that these gaps need to be filled with something. Otherwise, there are points of political intervention and weaker links in the chain. So it clarifies the role of state and the way that nation and state can appear. That's why he yeah. will give political analysis of Bonapartism and this thing yes. there. Yes. Uh, and so on. So you have all these tools that are developed there, but they are kind of weakly systematized. And we get 10, after 10 years, we now get, let's say, a step by step construction, not only of how these things are integrated into what he will call the nation state capital system. Right, which would be a basic form of modern society where you have like these three, three different logics interacting. Uh, but a way of thinking about these logics that allows us to think about world history and to recuperate a theory of you know, world history with a kind of structural or what he will call a transcendental analysis of world history. So we're concerned with the transformation of these frames that predetermine or help to constitute how social reality appears to us, right? And keeping to this finding of transcritique, which is to develop a theory of something which is has the transcendental power, it is predetermining constitutive of, of social reality, but at the same time, historical. It can be changed, goes through transformations, it is not set in stone or built into our cognitive existence, right? Uh, and the way that he does this, and I, it's it's funny because he claims at the beginning of structure of world history that he realized that the first guy to look at this and systematize this thing that he mentioned at the end of Transcritique, the nation and the state and capital integrating somehow, was Hegel in the philosophy of right. Yep. Uh, and I think that it's even clearer in in that little short text from the philosophy of history, uh, reasoning history. Uh, but you get many places. This idea where you, civil society and the state are presented as kind of dual in contradiction. For example, civil society is the place of the will. So people organize around their different wills and different necessities. And when you do this, conflicts emerge. So we develop, for example, a set of laws to regulate our behavior. But when you do this, you, in this objectivation of will through law, you create a contradiction, a conflict, because even though law is a product of our wills in a certain sense to regulate our wills, it starts, it can create a mismatch, 
between state and civil society. And culture is, is the sort of third communitarian dimension that can, let's say, express and conciliate the conflict between these things. So he says, well, this model where you have civil society with the economic realm, state and culture or, or this kind of identity, national spirit coming to give expression to this conflict, right? Uh, and also to, to, to give it form. You have this basic Trinitarian structure, right? He will give, I, I'm not sure if he gives this example, but it's an example Hegel gives, right? For example, you have a system in civil so Greek society that is based on uh, uh, will, the vengeance and so on. Uh, Antigone, for, for example, in this system, for example, you might you know, lose a brother and then you want to bury him, but this is against the law. So you mm -hmm. have a conflict between the law and desire. And then you have, let's say, a theater play mm -hmm. that stages this conflict, you know, proposes a kind of form for it so it becomes thinkable. And you can so, see all three spheres interacting, the cultural, the state, the uh, civil. Yeah, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So you get that idea. So he starts by saying, look at this. So he starts right. with a kind of reading of Hegel, which itself is very debatable, very curious, especially because one might claim that the contradiction that Hegel used to see between will and law, mm. uh, what Marx does in his critique to the philosophy of right is to move the contradiction inside the realm of the will. So the contradiction is no longer between will and law to be solved by culture, mm. but the contradiction is within the will because some people will things and they have the means to do it. Some people don't even have the means to will, right? Uh, civil society itself is written by a contradiction between forces of production and relations of production. Uh, that contradiction is up with the state, right? And then the state itself is for Marx already an expression and conciliation of this with culture appearing as... I mean, you could, you could go into that fine-grained discussion, which in a way Karatani does cover every mode for him, every one of these realms will be written with contradictions, in fact. Mm. But he starts with this reading of Hegel, and actually, the first thing he does, even before he says this, he says, you know, Marxists usually focus on the concept of modes of production to start thinking about history and, you know, deep history, long history of social right. formations. And we're going to change it up. We're going to think about modes of exchange. Uh, I tend to prefer the word intercourse rather than exchange, simply because if you continue reading uh, the, the, the book, you see that uh, he, he makes some remarks to, to, let me see if I can find it here. I, I might even have it here. He says that he's taking the, the, the term from, from the German Fiatkea, and, and then even to stock vessel, uh, vessel like, e like exchange even at the material level, when you would say a system exchange energy with another, the word exchange is not meant to signal like exchange value or like an exchange in the sense of two equivalent things being traded, right? It's not modes of trade. It's modes of exchange in this broader sense that things go in and out of a boundary. So we can, we should be able, we should be able to apply it, for example, to exchanges with nature. Mm. Mm. So it's not mode of exchange in the sense of trade. I think that's crucial. Otherwise, it, it, that's why I tend to use intercourse, where that idea of, you know, something crossing a boundary with another is more relevant. And if we recall, you know, how this idea has been at play since his reading of Saussure in '73, it makes more sense to to keep to the broadest idea of translation or circulation between systems, right? Yeah, absolutely. And he says, we want to look into this. We want to start not from modes of uh, production, but from modes of intercourse. Uh, and you see that he's already, this is also a move. It doesn't undo the things he did in Transcritique, but it's also a move as kind of zoom out because we already saw gaps in the logic of capitalist production and and, and circulation, right? This, this fatal leap mm -hmm. uh, where surplus needs to go through to realize itself as profit and so on. Uh, 
But now he wants to look at the logic of these other modes that can help this fatal leap, for example, from, from you know, getting in the way of capital circulation. So we're now looking at this broader thing and we want to, we're not moving away from production and saying production is not important or everything is actually exchange. That's what he's saying. A lot of people call Cartagena a circulationist, as if he's saying that value is produced in circulation or production is in, inessential. You could have like a conventionalist idea of value. This is not what he's saying. But he wants to move out because he needs to find the thing that state, nation, and capital as kind of dynamics or logics have in common. And what they have in common is that they all imply some type of, again, intercourse. Right, and we want to specify things both by looking into the specificities of each of these modes, and second by combining them. And I find that this takes us back to the causal uno thing we were talking about because uh, one thing I know he takes from uno is this idea that Marx's analysis of capital implies this connection between uh, it's an abstraction. It, take, it leaves out, for example, analysis of taxes, analysis of the state, analysis of property relations in more detail. Uh, it, it, leaves, it does its best to present the logic of value and the logic of surplus, the logic of capital in its purer form, but it implies a reduction to do so. It implies kind of an abstraction from the world to do so. Uh, but for, for Caratani, this is not a problem. So this idea of a pure theory, the merits of the pure theory of something which doesn't exist in that way in reality, that the idea that this is a good method, you can see that he takes in part from Uno and in part from his reading, his even in architecture as metaphor, when he was engaging with Derrida, one of the points that he makes uh, is that you know, when they started writing, the first thing he did was to write a, a commentary on the origin of geometry by Russell. So this kind of engagement with mathematics that's at the origin of phenomenology and by, the, by continuation at the origin of deconstructionism and all of that, that engagement is really important. And this insight that when you go to the purest form is not when you get rid of contradictions, but when contradictions appear more clearly, uh, which is something that, again, his idea of formalisms as being contradiction-ridden precisely because you get the purer version of them is at stake there. So he makes a weird remark about Marx abstracting away from aspects that come from other logics, like the state or uh, affinity, reciprocity, and so on, to present us this pure mode, this pure logic of capital, and he does, he extends this idea to the other modes themselves. And he will look, for example, at Hobbes as a thinker that did something similar to the logic of state, of modern state, as somebody who abstracted away, for example, from the, the very sp the specific problems of communitarian relations, which actually, let's say, when you say that everyone is at war with everyone, what you really mean is communities at war with one another. But because he's abstracting away, yeah. From the communitarian relations, you get this pure theory of the state. Almost. This is this right. is kind of the method of bracketing. Exactly. This is what he calls the method of bracketing. Yeah. It's at stake in his theory of the parallax already. I really, I really think it's a nice. This is why I like Karatani in the sense that we. I was having a debate on Twitter, like, oh well, do you agree with him polemically? I don't even care. I mean, like, he makes me think, right? Like, it's a different way to think about, like, uh, getting to the root of. The logic of a system and things of this. Can you could you say a little bit more about bracketing? I think it's mentioned in architecture as metaphor, as a method, but it's obviously something that he uses all throughout his. Yeah, I mean, I, I we mentioned before this idea that there is something about a transcendental that is like value is a the value form in, is a transcendental form, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't arrive at it by leaving out all of reality and just going back to your cognitive the things your cognition cannot but so presuppose when it constitutes objects like the Kantian approach what it does is actually it abstracts from everything which is not part of a social logic so let's say 
there is something like a reduction, like a phenomenological reduction in the sense of Russell. Actually, I mean, this is a bit of a side note, but in my opinion, a clarifying side note. Uh, in a book called, I mean, a book called, in, in Logics of Worlds, but Alain Badiou has a definition of the difference between subjective phenomenology and objective phenomenology. And uh, I think it applies very nicely to what Karatani is doing because uh, in, in, I think that the term he uses is, uh, he says, uh, Yeah, he says that uh, you're trying, like, like both phenomenologists try to neutralize something uh, of an object in order to emerge some structure. So, but in Russell, they're trying to neutralize something like the real existence to allow, you know, the intentional or living dimension of the object to appear, right? But with object, you, you're doing objective phenomenology when you do the inverse. You try to, uh, he, he says, locally test the logical resistance of the object. So you want to you want to put it to as many variations as possible and see what resists. Resists not only translation between systems, but resists even, let's say, you changing your position and the thing remains the same. That thing that remains the same under all these transformations, that's the part of the object that you're interested in. And he says, well, this is what we call objective phenomenology. You vary the living existence, the lived experience, and what resists the lived experience, that's what we call the logical dimension, the, 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 the logical dimension of this social form. While subjective phenomenology will do the inverse, right? You vary the real existence. You try to remove it, abstract, neutralize that real existence of it, its situatedness, to only leave out or to allow to exist the, the lived experience of the thing. I think Karatani fits much more this objective phenomenological side. So what's left of his process of reduction, what, when you, it's not so much our experience of things, but his theory of world history is a theory, not of how we experience things, but what must have happened or be happening behind their backs so that we then experience things in this way. And sometimes it's almost indifferent to our experience. You know? To all of this to say that when he talks about bracketing, uh, I feel like there are two things that are happening. One is, uh, first is this idea that you have like a, multi a, a multiple object that you can reduce it in many ways. He takes an example again from Kant, but again, in a way that Kant does not present it himself. And he says, uh, uh, yeah, imagine you have an object, you can ask many questions of that object. For example, is it pleasant or displeasant? Is it true? Is it false? Is it right? Is it wrong? And he says, you turn that object, you constitute it that multiple as an object of a static inquiry. When you forget, you bracket, you remove questions of right and wrong and true and false. You don't care if it's an illusion or not, and you don't care if it's morally correct or not. When you remove all of that, the and only leave questions of if it's pleasant or not, you suddenly constitute it as an object of taste, right? Of a aesthetic inquiry. If you, if you bracket questions of taste and questions of morally right and wrong, you leave questions of true and false. And that object as purely a concern of is it, is it what it is or not, that's what becomes an object of scientific inquiry. And, and the same for ethics with bracketing science and art and living the questions of the, if it's right and wrong. In reality, these things are all mixed. You can never tell them apart. You need to take a step back and forget parts of the object to constitute it as a consistent object of inquiry of a certain field, right? So bracketing is a strange mixture of abstracting away from the concrete, but that's not taking you further away from reality. By taking the mess out, you are able to spell out a consistent logic that you wouldn't be able to see directly because it never appears directly to you, right? You don't see objects of moral, aesthetic, or scientific inquiry. All objects are an inquiry of everything at once, and there seems to be no logic for any of those things, 
you actually need to create this artificial abstraction processes to be able to turn them into uh, problems for a field, right? But then, so while usually we think abstraction removes us from reality, all of these different bracketings and constitutions of the same object as objects of inquiry for a given field are actually capturing something real about the object. It's just that you cannot capture everything that is real about an object from one given position, right? So it's a, it's a particular way of thinking uh, about uh, this reduction or abstraction where you're both cutting up the thing into parts, mm. but because you cut it into parts, you, you get to analyze it and get closer to it rather than get further away from it. Mm. Uh, and he applies this theory of bracketings to, I mean, with a bit of a transformation. I mean, he doesn't talk about it in those terms anymore, but to these modes of intercourse. He will say social phenomena are actually always a mixture. There is no one social phenomena that is, you know, pure commodity. Commodities, for example, in modern societies is also a property. And it's there are property owners, and there is the level of value of these prop of these commodities, which concerns the communities and customs and you know more subjectivized values that things acquire. I would even say we can probably separate three terms here because you can have value, you can have how, what's the word in English for this try it? Uh, you know, you can have wealth, value, and uh, yeah, property, perhaps, right? Like you can you can feel like you're wealthy because you have things that you know are very valuable to you according to your customs and so on, but they don't have value in the sense that Marx uses the word value, right? There's a distinction between these different meanings of richness, right? Uh, so in reality, they're all mixed. You have customs and communi communitarian dimensions affecting things that also exist in a dimension of property and contracts and law, but it also exists in the dimension of value and commodity and surplus. They're all mixed together. And you actually need to abstract away from reality in order to arrive at, let's say, a purer form of description, which is both, let's say, more consistent in the sense that it gives you the means to work out the inner logic of what's going on, but also inconsistent in the sense that if they were the only thing existing in reality, they would actually lead us to contradictions and problems that the other logics help you to solve. So it's a weird mixture. On the one hand, you need to, for example, abstract away from property and communitarian relations to think about value as a form that transcendentally constitutes, you know, the way we produce objects and so on. But if in reality there was only capital and there was only value and there weren't property relations and communitarian relations, value would self-implode. Because, of, for example, as we talked about this kind of leap between production and circulation, mm. because property relations guarantee, you know, uh, I mean, a crucial aspect of primitive accumulation without which you cannot have the fictive commodities that allow uh, surplus to be extracted. So you need these other things. Without them, it would just self-implode. And I even think you can go further. Like, uh, I'll just give you guys a, a, a brief kind of description of the four modes that Karatani describes. So this is already kind of a, uh, the crucial thing, right? We'll, in Transcritique, uh, here he ends up talking about you know nation state and capital and he already puts Kant socialism uh, as this fourth thing without describing very neatly when we get to uh, it, it's very much ethical in, in in nature this other thing when we get to structure of world history now he actually merges and, and he kind of uh, serializes these things in a much more systematic way where you know, the logic of nation, the logic of state, and the logic of capital, they're first generalized. So nation, state, and capital are particular historical forms of broader logics, so much broader that they need to be accounted for in every social formation, 
So they couldn't be called capital and state in nation because nation, state, and capital don't exist in every social formation. So it just calls them A, B, and C. A for the logic of gift and reciprocity, B for the logic of contract, law, state, plunder, and redistribution more generally, and C for logic of commodity exchange, which exists you know, in many, many societies without becoming capitalism, right? But then he adds mode D, which because it is a mode of intercourse, should not be understood as like an ethical system based you know, on individual rationality and something like that. It's meant to be an economic description. Right? He calls every one of these modes economic modes, modes of economic intercourse. So for him, religion is an econ economy, right? Uh, at least in principle, the way that it's meant to organize trades, intercourses, transformations, and so on. Uh, and then, so first you, so you have all these different things happening at once. First, you generalize these modes, A, B, C, D, Right. Uh, if if Karatani was Probocheski, he wouldn't write the ABC of communism. He would write the ABCD of communism. Uh, and second, he's putting this fourth logic, which he calls sometimes X, this thing that hasn't really been fully developed yet. He puts it first in the series with his other three. He says there is reciprocity, there is plunder or state logic, there is commodity exchange. And there is free association. Free association is an economic logic of intercourse mm. with humans and nature as any other, right? Uh, and so just to dis distinguish them, to make them a bit clearer, I think it's quite easy. So we could simply say that the logically speaking, mode A is about pooling and reciprocity. Uh, mode, mode B is about plunder and redistribution. So, for example, taxation, where you take money from people but then redistribute in terms of services, for example. That it's still, still plunder and redistribution, but with a you know, human face. Uh, commodity exchange, the exchange of objects where proprietors or productors, produ uh, producers are different, but objects are equal, right? Uh, is commodity exchange, broadly speaking. And then mode D would be the logic of the mutuality of freedom, where both parties treat each other as ends in themselves, not as means. Uh, the form that mode A takes is the gift. So if you read like the, the main author for, for Karatani to discuss mode A is Marcel Moss, for sure. Mm -hmm. He's actually quite telling how little he uses Levi's trust in all of this. I wonder if it has to do with his alternative reading of Saussure, why he does not... More, more clearly engaged with with uh, with uh, Levi Strauss there, and he also talks about uh, you know many anthropologists, uh, Salins and others. Yeah, but it's basically the logic of gift and counter gift, uh, with the crucial thing which I think we can already introduce, which is that once you look at the the, the, the logic of mode A, you can already understand why logics left their own devices tend to have inner inconsistencies that require mm -hmm. the other modes to make sense because, you know, the logic of gift taken far enough becomes the logic of sacrifice, right? Or yeah. There is no, no necessity that a mode appear only in a positive, socially cohesive phase. Every mode has both a cohesive aspect and a destructive aspect. So you mm -hmm. would say mode A has both gift but the paradoxical or inconsistent appearance of sacrifice and destruction, war, mm -hmm. right? So let's say the, the, the inverse or the subversive dimension of mode A, which doesn't, it's not a negation, it's its internal kind of critical point is war. War is a form of making a community, right? Having enemies is not, for most part, uh, not recognizing the other is a very honorable way of recognizing others to have yeah. enemies, yeah. right? So the negative face of reciprocity remains reciprocity. Mode B, uh, we know it. The opposite of law, the opposite of state is revolution. And revolution is not just the negation of state. I mean, most literature around revolution is, you know, sad, but realistic about the fact that revolutions tend to be sometimes the most legitimate form of the appearance of the state and often lead to new states. They don't guarantee the disappearance, the withering of the state. 
So again, you get inside the mode B based on law, contract, monopoly of violence, you know, taxation and all the things we associate with state logic. You get an inner critical point, which is not the same as its negation. And the same with mode C, the other side of capital, commodity exchange, surplus value is crisis without crisis being in itself escape from capital, but an inner critical point, right? So all of these are dimensions of each mode that left unchecked, they invert into their critical phase, their yeah. destructive phase. And often the other modes are the ones that come into play to prevent this critical point of arriving. So the state prevents the, cri the crisis in capital to emerge, but then communitarian relations and national sentiment and sovereignty uh, movements prevent revolutions sometimes or condu conduce revolutions in certain dimensions, right? Directions. Yeah. Uh, and they all, it's also the reason, it's also the reason why he says that state, nation state prevents in this conjecture that we, that we live in the emergence of one um, hegemonic empire. And this is why he says uh, Hart and Negri are wrong to say something like the concept of empire has any merit. And he actually says, yeah, uh, it makes much more sense to say we're our era. He has a wonderful essay called um, On Neoliberalism. I forget the title of it, but he says our era is defined as an imperialist era. But it's not an imperialist era in which there's one, you know, empire because of the contradictions in the relations between the modes especially between state. Um, so that, that I found interesting. But one thing I, I, I wanted to flag was... Just before we go on, just, can I just leave this as an exercise to the reader? Because I didn't mention what is the negative face of mode D. Right. And what is that? Like, cool, mutuality of freedom, free association of equals, unreciprocated gift, cosmopolitanism, world republic, Okay, but what is the negative face, the critical point of this mode, if it is a mode like the others? Karatani doesn't go there, so it's a good thing to, to think about. Yeah, no, that, that, that is interesting. But let me say one thing, because D, uh, you, you, you said there's four, and I felt like... Um, in a sense, D is uh, to say that there's four doesn't make sense to me because um, D is this um, principle which returns us to A. It's not as if D is a um, D, D in some sense is a um, vanishing mediator. It's not a clearly defined logic. It seems almost as a, a kind of a vanishing thing. mediator. Um, because its exchange structure is A, it is a return of A in higher form, he says. He says D is the appearance of A in higher form. So I've always thought of D as a, um, a mode which emerges to reshuffle the organization and relation between the modes, not as some fixed relation that's stitched into the other three okay like we can just explain i think I'm just add some some detail to make sure we can kind of frame the question well because so once we define these four modes and i think you're already pointing to something important but one of the reasons why i personally think we don't need modi in the same way i i would rather i think we can the book would work pretty well without it uh though i, I know karatani has doubled his wager on it by writing a book that's mostly about Modi recently, perhaps to clarify these, these critiques. But uh, before we get there, so with this method of bracketing, this, this theory of what I think we could properly call objective phenomenology, because it's a theory of how pheno social phenomena are constituted. So it's a transcendental theory, but it's not a theory of how we as cognitive subjects are transcendentally constituted is a theory of how social practices will constitute social reality right i think in this sense he falls close to closer to people like son rattle who nobody would call a kantian because he's 
trying to give you the genesis of something we call Kantian, right? He's saying that there's a social practice which has a transcendental power, right? That's much closer to what Karatani is doing, even though he has different commitments than, than Sonreto. Uh, so he tells us about these modes. He says, you get to them by abstracting away from aspects of reality. But the moment you do so, you actually get the description of some, of a logic. Uh, you get to see the properties of this logic much clearer. And you get to understand at which points, which each one of these logics can kind of help one another in this mixed way to actually constitute a social world. So this brings us back to our definition of social formations. And now we can claim that every social formation is an arrangement of these different logics in singular ways. And Karatani will give us many axes to consider the singularity of a social formation, not only uh, how these modes are connected, but which mode is the dominant one. By dominant mode, even though I don't think he gives a satis satisfactory definition, I think we can pretty much establish which is the mode that is the most responsible for the cohesion of that social world. So for example, there is mode C in certain tribal you know, societies. For example, between federations of tribes, they can do something which was called silent trade, which is very much a commodity exchange. I leave an object, you go there. If you want the object that I left, you put another of the same value and go back home with the one I previously left, then I take the one you left. And it's an equivalent. No debt is created. No connection is created between us. Really good mode to exchange with strangers that you want to keep as strangers. So mode C is present, therefore, in that social formation. But if you were to remove it, it wouldn't change the fundamental characteristics of that space, which are much more indebted to reciprocity. Pooling, balanced reciprocity, negative reciprocity, the, the birth of communities, the establishment of federations, and so on. The keeping of inequality in check through a certain type of debt creation and so on. So he first says, well, we need to look at not only how they are arranged in, like these mixtures, but there is also the fact of which one of the modes is the dominant mode. So you can have a lot of different societies that will have, for example, mode A as a dominant. A bunch of different societies that have mode B as dominant. And then you have a bunch of societies with mode C as dominant, and we haven't had any with mode D yet, right? Uh, so which mode is the dominant one? I like to think of it as a chord, kind of the, the one that gives you the bass note that you listen to the, everything else with, in relation to it. Uh, kind of as a way of thinking about this dominance. But there's also a spatial component because you can have a dominant structure with capital at the bottom, giving the cohesion of a state and communitarian or reciprocal set of communities on top. But it's further from the center of a world system, for example, or it's closer to the center. So he takes this kind of world systems analysis of, you know, center, margins, submargins, or, you know, cores and peripheries. And he also spreads these logical categories geographically and shows that this is also a feature that gives them singularity, right? So you end up with these four modes uh, and a spatial and temporal way of variating them that gives you a very rich vocabulary to talk about the singularity of social formation. Now, you could say, oh, but what about modes of production? Have we then lost, you know, the classic historical materialist analysis of modes of production? No, you will now be able to define what production means for any one of these worlds. Like the question now becomes, what must be happening so that production appears as what it is for those people in that social formation? So why is it that if you read, I don't know, Marilyn Strathern or, or Marshall Salins talking about what production is for Melanesian people, they don't see themselves producing when we see ourselves producing. They don't think they're doing labor exactly where we think we're la doing labor. It's a very different social formation that production is divided across gendered lines in specific ways. You want to be able to account for all of that, right? So it's not so much that we dismissed production as a core concept. We just don't treat it as a primitive concept. Production is the, is the combined uh, oper operation. It's, it's operation that it's the, the product of combining 
more primitive operation. So the way you exchange with nature, if nature is conceived as a partner, already prevents you from thinking that you're producing by taking something from nature, changing it and putting it back into circulation for consumption. You need to have a relationship to, you know, what's not human that emerges as if it's inert and without form so that you can then take it, change it, give it a new form and call that creation. If you need to respect the form that things have around you and you give them kind of a soul, when you create and you produce, you're actually destroy, destroying something, not necessarily producing. So you can give a transcendental theory of why, what we do looks like production in our society and other things look like productive activity in other societies or why economic production in the sense of production of value might not be so central in other social forms, right? Uh, I didn't say this, but we can also have a concept of, you know, types of social grouping for each one of these modes. So you have, you know, uh, hierarchies of honor and caste. Uh, I don't know how you say this in English, caste? Yeah. Uh, or, or hierarchies of domination and status uh, and hierarchies of class in mode C, right? So you can now imagine how all these things get mixed together uh, in this society. So you don't lose, again, class antagonism and all these things, but you get to filter them through how these things get constituted for each one of these modes mm -hmm. uh, or each one of these social formations. Mm -hmm. Now, what I, why I think this, is, this whole description is needed to get to your question, because Karateni does a couple of things. Like uh, once he gives you all this complicated kind of vocabulary to talk about how each social formation is structured slightly different, right? For example, using his theory, we could talk about the distinction between uh, segregation, racial segregation in the United States and racial segregation in the formation of Brazilian society. I think I, talk, I spoke with you, Daniel, about this already. Like, I, I find this very useful because you can see the formation of American society very much as you know, a capitalist environment where already segregated communities emerge and the state it had, takes on a federalist form to preserve the segregation of communities for the sake of market financial interests. In Brazil, that's not the case. You have a capitalist interest. You have the state first, with no communities established. The state just kills off indigenous populations. Does huge primitive accumulation. Everything belongs to the crown. And then communities are built on top based on hierarchies of work. So Portuguese people come, slaves come. So you have a different kind of chord, if you want, where you have like, capital state communities, where in the states you have capital community state. So you can actually start talking about that singularity, right? But he kind of creates a problem for himself, or at least let's say it's for me the place where he's clearly still the most indebted to a kind of French structuralist kind of approach, which I don't like very much, which is his theory of transitions. So he now needs to account for why did societies of dominated by both A appear to begin with? How do they change into societies based on mode B and mode C? And from mode B to mode C, from state to capital, I think he gives like amazing analysis. I, I find him very convincing the way he discusses the passage from feudalism to capitalism, the analysis of capitalism as emerging in a sub-margin of empires. I mean, it's also more established to have other writers talking about this. That classic book on uh, provincializing Europe presents a very similar theory. Other authors do so. But when he talks about, and I think that his passage from both A to B, talking about how uh, you read Hobbes better if you assume he's talking about communities that dominate one another and the commonwealth by fear that one community places on the other actually are, are already allows us to understand the kind of social pact of the state that turns, let's say, the, the decimation of one community by another into a logic of plunder and redistribution. Uh, but the early stuff where he talks about we were nomadic people, 
we became sedentary due to climate change, which I find very interesting take that he, he based on, on some uh, Japanese uh, historians. Uh, so he takes a sedentary revolution to proceed our agriculture instead of the inverse, where we became, you know, savvy on, on, on how to treat the soil. That's why we stopped moving. But his account there is very much based on repression. Like we, we become sedentary and we repress our nomadism and then it returns as a kind of, you know, uh, impetus inside the state for rebellion. Mm -hmm. And then this impetus becomes religion. And this impetus of religion then returns as philosophy. It's a whole history of returns of the repressed and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, 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 very psychological yeah. And, and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm surprised that you don't like that because this is where he makes the reference to Ernst Bloch and the... Uh, um, Bloch as a great theorist of Modi and using using a kind of Freudo Freudo Marxist concept of the of the drive of D and even just to quote from a uh, structure of world history he says strictly speaking Modi is not a mode of exchange because Modi is a drive to supersede the modes of exchange whether that be a b or c so you see, this goes back to my question, which is, okay, Modi emerges as world religions, and there's a specific historical moment for this, just as there's a specific moment for the emergence of B, for example, and C, yeah? No, 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 no. Oh, for him, all modes exist all the time. There's no birth of any particular... Uh, 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 okay, but, that, but, but I don't understand the logic of D then, because how can D... Um, how, what I, the passage I just read, how does that square with your argument that actually D is not, or that D is rather a, a feature of the current stitching of the four modes that we live with today? No, I didn't say, why, why did I say that, that, that D is a current feature? Of the right, it, ha, it would have to be, wouldn't it? No, I'm, I'm following Karatani. I don't agree. Like I, I, Karatani says as much. He says, A, that... Uh, all modes exist from the beginning, just the dominance of each mode requires further development. So mode B is in, in uh, uh, how do you call it, potentially already, let's say virtually existing within tribe societies, which is let's say cl Pierre Clastres claim, right? Societies against the state, even societies that didn't have the state, they were working against the specter of that accumulation of inequality and status and so on. It's not like it didn't exist. And mode C already existed in the societies as well. So he doesn't claim modes are invented. He claims they're right. all there. Because, but he gives because... the prehistory of them out right. of nomadism. Right? Mm -hmm. And then right. he takes this idea, two ideas. First, nomadism would be a society where we don't accumulate. Gifts are unreciprocated because, you know, if I accumulate a bunch of apples... And I cannot eat them all. I'll just give it to you. You don't need to give me anything back. Like I won't lose anything by giving them to you. So he suggests that you have like a proto mode D before mode A, which is already a lot closed, consistent logic of reciprocity, and gift giving as a form of power. He does, one thing that he does that is really good is that he doesn't romanticize reciprocity and gift giving. Gifts are a form of power. I mean, everyone knows that if you get like a really expensive gift from a friend, it's kind of annoying because now you owe them something, you know, gift. I mean, being in debt is not that much of a problem. Like sometimes being in debt to someone else is creating a bond and that's crucial, but it is a form of connection and ties you to the other. You can depend on somebody because they gave you a gift. So it doesn't turn it into this romantic, you know. So then, 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 what, is, then what is this whole thing with the death drive of D? What, what is yeah this? that's my point like uh, that that's where he's you, you don't know, like you don't like you don't like this whole thing no, i find it all crap <laughs> I, I knew it i knew it <laughs> i always said this. I love, like, that's not... what i love the most about it it's such a beautiful speculative uh thing. yeah because you like you like reading stuff i i i'm tired what do you dislike about it, though? Really, what is wrong with? Yeah, this? I mean, my, I mean, okay. Now we're moving. I, I just wanted to make sure we presented everything before we yeah. we criticize it. So just to conclude, before I say what I what I dislike about it, so he will give us a theory of you know nomadic societies that become sedentary. This establishes a kind of 
necessity of a social cohesion that's separated from just an intercourse with nature that is more fluid. Uh, and you have mode A, mode B, and mode C. Uh, and then you have the specter of this nomadic free form logic that returns from time and time again. And I think this is what you were referring to before when you said mode D looks like a mode of like a vanishing mediator, because he will say between mode A, dominance of mode A, dominance of reciprocity, dominance of the state, you have uh, the compulsion of, of gifts giving, which would be, let's say, the, this kind of specter of mode D. Then when mode B reappears uh, or becomes dominant, you have this sort of critique, imminent critique of the state that emerges with prophets and ethical religions and mystics, and that is slowly, let's say, turned into monotheism and other world religions, which would be this weird conciliation between the state logic and this kind of logic of transcending the social itself, which would be at the kind of origin of nomadism, right? Uh, and then again, in, in capitalism and societies based on mode C, that mode D principle would reemerge once more by proposing that we can have forms of community that transcend communitarian borders, which would be socialism, right? And he says, well, we're still looking for a society that would have Modi as its dominant form. That would be proper socialism. We never saw that, right? And he uses the other modes to show that Soviet Union and other uh, socialist experiments never really managed to break with the state or break with capital or break with nation properly, right? So. That's kind of what he shows. He, he goes as far as showing that Modi exists. It exists because we see it in the transitions. Uh, it, it helps explain the relevance, the kind of rebellious power within each of these things. So I give you a gift. You're not allowed to accumulate everyone's gift. You're obliged to give back. Why are you obliged to give back? His explanation is, because nomadism still exists as a menace in our heads, and we feel like we need to return. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's a menace that explains the compulsion of the gift. Then why, once state exists, our world religions both such a powerful tool of unification by the state, but also kind of imminent critique of those states of inequality, of markets, of you know corruption. Hmm. Well, because they, they carry the seed of Modi inside of them, right? And then when you get to capitalism, but why did labor organize into socialism and propose some other vision of the world? How do you call this? And it says, again, socialism is Modi under the dominance of Modi. My, so this is kind of how he presents it. So it's actually a two-step thing. You don't need Modi to explain any economic or cohesive social phenomena in any of the social formations he presented. You only needed to explain that kind of, uh, I mean, he, it explains different things in different parts of the book. It doesn't explain always the same. So the compulsion to give back in mode A, which I mean, a bunch of anthropologists can explain that with absolutely no need of going into the specter of nomadism or, uh, you know, the self-contradictory nature of world religions, which Hegel can explain without having to talk about, you know, there being a, a other mode of that's haunting from the outside uh, the state, or you know, the relation between socialism and philosophy. All these things are so. So when you look from afar, you see a kind of a big basket where nomadism, the obligation of the gift. Uh, world religions and ethical prophets, philosophy, but in a very specific sense of philosophy, socialist politics, all fit into that basket. They're all treated as part of this mode, but this mode is never, never gets to show the, the thing that qualifies it as a mode, because each one of the modes are modes of intercourse. They're modes of intercourse, they are for Karatani, transcendental economic principles that constitute parts of social reality that need one another. So it's given a separate treatment and it's very uncertain for me at least how much it is a bit of a kind of, it's 
it's playing a double role. First, it's the very reason why he wrote the whole book. He wrote the whole book because he wants to give credence to a new form of socialist thinking. So to give it a history in a book like The Structure of World History is pretty much to make it emerge out of the mode somehow. And the best way he could, it was this. A big parenthesis here. This is for me the proof and the only point where I think that his relation to Derrida, his relation to French structuralism and to psychoanalysis remains limiting because rather than make organizational analysis, like the best moments in structure of world history in terms of mode D is when he talks about cooperatives, joint ventures, like proper collective experiments that have economic power of binding together real social reality in a new way. But the core moments is when he talks about ethics, treating people as me as ends and not a means, hospitality. It's all about otherness and unreciprocated gift. The example that he gives is Japan, like the, the concrete kind of geopolitical example is Japan deciding not to have an army anymore mm -hmm. after World War II, which is like a big, you know, complicated, messy event. It's not like an act of pure solidarity. It's like a very complicated thing. So, so on the one hand, I feel he needs the Modi because he wants to show us that, you know, there is an underlying logic. This underlying logic of socialism can be seen in philosophy. Philosophers have a say on the form that this logic has. It has something to do with reason, with ethics, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, he wants to give it a long history to show that it's essential. He wants to kind of take a bit of a uh, crumb out of the kind of sequent theory of history where after capitalism, there comes communism because after mode C dominating, only mode D could come to dominate. But on the other hand, to accomplish these goals, he does a bit of a kind of a platypus of a concept. Like a, it's a mix of yeah. <laughs> many things. It's solving complicated passages where his concepts are too, too weak. Like his theory of reciprocity is ingenious and interesting. And I know many anthropologists who find it like a relief to see a Marxist dealing with anthropology, but at the same time, it's not the state of the art of what how anthropologists conceive, conceive of the gift. And more contemporary versions of it already account for things that he brings mode D in order to, to explain. So unreciprocated unre 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 gift is just the basis of mode A. You don't need mode D to account for that concept. Then it explains things about world religion and so on that I find that some Marxists with theological inclinations that I know, like yourself, are just so happy that he's telling us socialism is ultimately, you know, just an ex continuation of world religions, which, I mean, I don't think he even believes this that much. Uh, then, you know, he just does a lot of this kind of make it fit in many places. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not sure I don't know Japan at all, but coming from a place like Brazil, where the, the role of religion in organizing society today is very important, you can see that it's not insofar as religion, like new Pentecostalism, Catholicism, is bringing a fourth mode that right. it is helping to organize social cohesion. It's precisely because it substitutes mode A in a way that's more compatible with the state and not so critical of it. So it's not so much as the core thing that is proper to religion that mm -hmm. plays a role in, in the social economic structure is, is religion insofar as it mimics one of these three ABC modes. Yeah. Right. So I want to see where is this mode of, uh, where is the social formation where religion, qua religion, plays such a crucial economic role. So mm -hmm. since we don't have that, we end up having to treat Modi as if it's like, you know, qualitatively different than the others. It never needs to be put to the test of the same criteria that the other three are, are put. And I find that a bit deceiving. So I feel like if there is a good intention behind it, it's pointing to something interesting. It, it is an invitation to kind of look at history and collect a bunch of very interesting phenomena that don't really 
you know, fit to just mode A, B, and C. There is something about freedom, free association, which let's say is a long history of attempts, inventions, and trying something which is not A, B, and C, or that mixes them in a new way. But calling that like, you know, an economic form that was spelled out by Kant and that we kind of know the basic form of it. All we need is finding a way of making it emerge as, you know, a complex global order. I I I think it it short circuits things that uh, we don't need to to go so fast in proposing a solution. So there are so many interesting insights that he has in the way. And just to conclude this kind of big panorama, one of these very interesting insights, which you already mentioned, and that for me was one of the most refreshing things when I read it the first time, is that Karatani creates this plural vision of social formations, right? He kind of integrates the other, other Marxist thinkers and kind of heretic Marxists done this before. And there are many, many, today you can find many authors that do this kind of synchronic and diachronic analysis of, of modes. So not only modes in time, but also every formation being layered in many ways. Althusser, who is kind of a nemesis for Karatani, was trying to talk about the relative autonomy of different spheres, but you have Polanyi, talk, Karl Polanyi talking about, you know, different types of trade that happen, like market contracts, and I'm not sure if he calls reciprocal or, or communitarian trades, happening everywhere in all societies at once but with different emphases, you know, like many, like Diane Ellison talking about, you know, the domestic, the economic, the political modes at once, like many Marxists and heretics, if you want, talk about these layers. And I think he does this in a very sophisticated way, this putting them in a very strange place, because usually when we think about transcendental analysis, we think about the movement from the multiplicity of reality to something which is a unified thing. And he moves from multiplicity of reality to a kind of three-body problem where you have like value, reciprocity, and state power as things that don't really fit perfectly. And they're all kind of pushing like attractors in different directions, you know? So it's kind of a polymorphous transcendental theory where reality is always a singular solution to a transcendental problem, not a transcendental yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. It's very Lacanian delusion in that sense mm -hmm. as well. But he also extends this kind of plurality to po the political sphere to the left. So he's very charitable, I believe, with anarchism, communism. I mean, he has a particular hate for state socialism as if it, nothing ever good came from it. Uh, which I think he's been changing his mind a bit over time. But generally, for example, he downplays certain sectarian divides between Proudhon and Marx and Stirner and Marx. And he, not only at the level of the authors, but also the movements, that these things are more mixed together than we usually think of, think them of, right? Uh, as being. So, yeah, exactly. Also very yeah. yeah, because he, in a way, like, yeah, Marx could write uh, the poverty of philosophy, but in reality, the confrontation with both utopian socialists and the anarchists taken on the whole uh, actually performed a type of bracketing on the question of the state for Marx himself, which only Karatani could recognize by reading Marx in the way that he reads him in that sense. So there, therefore, then you can erase the history of those polemics and those sectarian texts of back and forth between Marxists and anarchists because uh, they don't point to something which is vital in a, a broader historical sweep of understanding. It's kind of like a secondary piece of history in some sense, right? Which I think is, which I think is really useful. I mean, I think on the critique of associationism, though, like the NAM movement, I mean, I think that there's many problems with it to a certain extent in, in maybe evidenced by the fact Sorry, that problems where? on his own uh, praxis, his own NAM, the new association movement that um, like his organization that he tries to, to champion. I've done some research on it. I haven't found that it has much viability. It doesn't have much, um, I don't know, strength internationally. 
uh, it would be nice to see to see perhaps more thinking about what its core organizational strategy actually is. But I'm but I'm but I'm compelled by much of the premise that drives it drives it forward, um, for sure. I do want to say in our I, I know we've gone gone for over two hours and fifteen minutes. There was a very nice question. It's now on the screen. And from William Aguilar, which says, did Karatani find out what makes capitalism as such? What is capitalism's innermost kernel that 20th century communism failed to abolish, which makes them, I think, only a subspecies of capitalism? I don't think that's, I mean, there's a tricky part in this question, which is the idea that knowing what makes capitalism as such you know, abolishing the thing that makes it what it is is the is what is where communism failed. Like, there's so many we failed in so many ways that I don't think that's exactly the thing that was a problem. But I mean, I think that from Karatani, I, honestly, like many, many, many Marxist authors, you would find a basic answer in the form of, you know, a form of social synthesis based on the production, you know. The social reproduction of humanity ex essentially through the production of commodities, right? Uh, so a commodity producing society tends to be a society organized around the buying and selling of labor power. I think that that's pretty much the core of it. And mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's like... Uh, I, I feel like the way that he criticizes uh, communism is not so much that it failed to abolish... And I think that this is actually a, a change of, of, I mean, many authors do this as well, but I find it's also good in kind of funny that there, you know, sometimes the problem is not what you fail to abolish, but if you, if you did it with the means to put something else in place. And his critique is that state socialism is able to uncouple state and capital, but no, is unable, is able to uncouple capital a nation, but it requires you to espouse uh, mode B. So you need to, you need the strong state you know, to make sure you keep capital from occupying a dominant place. So you break with the dominating mode, mode C, but you uh, inadvertently put mode B in a certain sense. Up. And this is this is what um, Engels uh, ended up promoting. Which goes back to why, uh, in in a sense, it was a bad reading of what Marx's novelty was in Capital. So he did miss, and the workers' movement went more. Win I, more. I, I, the 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 reason that centralized state communism emerged from Caratani's uh, low res analysis has everything to do with the fact that Engels' influence on the exploitation of labor and it's kind of left Ricardian orientation meant that a strong state was needed in order to address the problem of surplus. But uh, it was done through a faulty understanding of power and of also the generation of surplus as such. In other words, Engels didn't have a true grasp of the transcendental production of other forms of value that Marx grasped. And that, that informed the praxis of state socialism and what would become Stalinism in that whole line. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's his critique of Engels. And he says on many, many occasions that Engels is the one responsible for centralized state communism. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you guys read trans critique or even uh, structural history, it's amazing how much he, every time he doesn't like something, either Althusser or Engels were to blame, even though they are the two ones that look the most like Karatani. Like, I'm sure it's an erotic problem because if somebody's trying to rewrite, you know, the origin of state, property, and family, that's Karatani. <laughs> Uh, and if somebody's talking about relative autonomy of different spheres, that's Karatani. So he probably criticizing his rivals in a way. And it's not a surprise that he's going back in the new book on power to Engels, who 
insisted on yeah. the centrality but, of I mean, I would power. say that there are, again, so there, I would say that there's this kind of scarecrow discussion of angles, which I honestly, I mean, every time somebody explains the failure of a huge social system based on reading something, I don't know what to do. That sounds ridiculous to me. Like, you know, how can you be a materialist and say people are screwing up socialism because of how they read people? If they had the problems, they would read them right, probably, I imagine, you know, if social being the term social consciousness. But one thing he does say is that we didn't have the means, and I think you can historically explain this and not just theoretically explain this, to realize the autonomy of state with regards to, to, cap to production and capitalist commodity production base, to the sense that there was a strategic point of view in uh, Soviet Russia that by um, dismantling or reconfiguring the productive sphere, you would by necessity already dis destroy or change the state sphere because one thing would depend on the other, like an edifice, right? I don't need to redo the penthouse if I'm destroying the basement. When I destroy the basement, everything falls. But it doesn't, right? And you can have like a, a status-based class of politicians and you can have a, a bureaucracy and things like this that acquire a big power. But you can account for this without talking about how you read angles. You can talk about this in terms of it. We never have been in that situation. There has never been. I always think that this is the best argument for all these things. Like, guys, there has never been before this 1917 moment a government where we had any chance of having proletariats or even like underclasses in power. It's not even proletariats. Like, What's the other example of trying this out? We never tried it out. So there were many things we didn't know, including how to deal with this autonomy of these fears, because you could imagine that they were more dependent than they were. So I can see this kind of having more charitable explanations than the angles read, read something wrong or something like this. Sure. But in any case, I, I would say that perhaps we can change William's question a bit and say that the whole problem is that you shouldn't be looking at what's essential about capitalism in terms of a logic, because what's essential is that it is a composite of logics with one of them as a dominating one. Once you look at it in this way, it's like a, a, one of those megazords in Japanese movies that are made of many different parts. If you cut some of them, like, yes, you cut the big thing, but the parts have some autonomy of their own, you know? Yeah. Or like a Medusa thing. So uh, this kind of multiplicity principle behind the thinking of social formations allows you to realize that even though these things are highly integrated and highly dependent, you can even move or change the dominating principle. That doesn't mean everything will wither away with it, mm -hmm. right? Things have some autonomy. I think that there is a lesson about this problem there that perhaps it's, a better way of framing it than in terms of what's essential, right? But I don't know. I'm not sure if I answered your question. There's another. Yeah, there's one from Andrew, which is um, something about um, Kantian associationism. Um, can that ethics work without the persistence of institutions um, that Hegel claims as essential? In other words, the claim is, is that, in fact, associationism is meant to wither the state. That, like, it's it's composed of of kind of localized alternative forms of exchange which are not reliant on reproducing c at a higher level but reproducing their own gift uh, models locally which would not then um which would then prevent c from coming in um from on high as it were yeah so they're meant to mitigate the dominance of c and his I, that's how i read his question and his, his question would be, is something like that even possible in the nation state capital? Uh, uh, can I just say something, which is uh, just to separate, uh, just because Andrew's question reminds me of something which I think it's useful. Again, this is not in Karatani, but I, I think it's a direct development of it in a very nice way, which is I mentioned to you guys that you can think of each mode as having a sort of, I don't want to use the word negative because negative implies perhaps negation, but negative in the sense of destructive or critical phase, right? Mm -hmm. Reciprocity, war is not the negation, but a negative phase of reciprocity. And 
revolution is a negative face of law, right, or state, and crisis is a negative face of capital. And Karatari talks about these modes interacting, but he only talks about the interacting in the positive face side. So capital inter interacts with nation that interacts with state, but nothing prevents us from imagining the dark version where crisis interacts with revolution that interacts with war. And this forms a stable social formation. That's Brazil. You know, yeah, I was gonna perpetual say, revolution yeah. of institutions, yeah. constant crisis so that you can pass on austerity measures and blame everyone for it. Yeah. A huge chronic unemployment and a civil war with your own population. Mm -hmm. In the States, you can go to war with you know everyone else but this is like you could you could write a little uh a book called dark karatani and just sort of yeah just yeah so like, but like, it implied there those, so yeah. uh i mean the, i i know daniel loves the bonapartism thing because you know it's it's your thing daniel but uh there is more under the sun in terms of terrible forms of things getting bound together than so uh, I, would, oh, I would already go with the dark Bonapartist version to separate yeah. historically the yeah. two things, which is always a good thing, you know. Uh, I don't think so. So that's just a point. And the second point now under yeah. this uh, yeah. proviso is that uh, again, you see, this is the issue. Like, yeah, Kantian associationism. That's not Karatani's idea. Like, he does claim that you see a, a glimpse which I also think that there are better thinkers to explain why modern philosophy is kind of, you know, not an opium of the people, but an opium of the socialist, of, you know, it expresses the suffering of the socialist for a form he doesn't know how to implement. Then you have all these thinkers saying beautiful things, but they can only exist like in their heads, you know. Uh, why disappears, like the thinking of, humanity as an end in themselves, not around means, thinking of all these things, like, yes, you see this expressed in Kant, but Kant is the inventor of the expression. He's not the inventor of free association. So there's oh, no reason sure. to call it Kantian. Sure. There's nothing Kantian about it. There are thousands and thousands of different forms of freely associating that happened since, you know, know to get like Badiou and like Spartacus, yeah, you know, freeing themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Spartan. So, like, this happens everywhere. There's nothing, that, nothing that's, that's, about. Yeah, no, uh, that's why. That's why I felt that um, the the parallel concept to Modi is Badiou's theory of communist invariance, which was actually a Soviet idea, uh, started um, around the time of Lukács and Bloch in like the twenties, where they were starting this kind of historical work. And um, I think Karatani should be read in line with some of those socialist inquiries as well. Okay, okay. fine. I mean, I, 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 I told you this many times, like when, when something like this is at stake, yeah. it's obvious that the best way to deal with it, in my opinion, is if you're engaged in a political movement, you will reconstruct the political history in a way that's favorable, So, which is fine, which is what you should mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as saying it is a transcendentally guaranteed thing. Like, these days, because of the work we've been doing on Karatani in like this subset of theoretical practice, this research collective, we've been working a lot on Karatani. I can today I can provide an explanation which I find very convincing as to why there are three modes, like a logical explanation of why there are three modes. Uh, I cannot do it with four, and as I try to show today, there is no property of what we call modi which is of the same quality of the properties that we describe for the other modes. So yeah. why call it a mode? You know, So it doesn't look so much like a closed mode with a logic that's pure right. in itself right. that you abstract from reality. I think it's something else we're talking about. I agree. So I agree. Even that, just to go back to Andrew's question, like, I don't see why this Bonapartist, Trumpist, destruction of institutions, like when you look at Kant, Kant talks about law, normative principles that are rendered explicit and acknowledged by reason and so on. Like, yeah, there's so many historically specific things to his formulation that I agree, these specificities are not here. You know, Kant would probably roll in his grave if he know, knew what, what respect for an institution, respect before the law has become. So yes, if we associate this too much to Kant, 
then it looks like anachronistic. But we don't need to, and I don't think Karatani makes such a big case of this. What he does suggest is that uh, I feel free association. Uh, my, my impression is that if you want to find like the basis for this, you should would be better to look not for uh, you know what he has to say about, about Kant, but what he has to say about cooperation. Mm. Uh, and I think that, it, I mean, it's no wonder that Jameson is so in love with the chapter in cooperation from Capital. I, I find that to be, uh, you know, the coolest formulation of generic that Marx proposed, like the only place in cap first volume of Capital where he talks about, you know, generic being very briefly, but this idea that people who, doing things together, they produce a surplus that doesn't belong to anyone. I find that idea of a kind of, surplus of the collective over the individuals the core idea behind free association mm. uh, because it's free in the sense that you organize as you please but that's not really the essential part the essential part is that the association is free from the people who are associated in a way you you produce something that the form of that organization has some autonomy over the people that were organized but we are allowed to serve ourselves of that excess a bit, right? You don't eliminate the excess by doing what you please, but you get to, let's say, ex become, let's say, strange from it in a productive way, rather than it being co-opted by, by property and com co commodified forms. Regardless of that, just to say that I, would, I don't think you need to have such a specific formulation of what free association means that would, uh, make it anachronistic to talk about it today. In fact, I would say the opposite. I tend to think that when you think under that line, which I agree, I'm introducing here from nowhere, right? But when you think that free association is more concerned with producing or creating in such a way that the strange products of your collective action, you still are responsible for it. That that formulation implies complexity, meaning emergent aspects that you didn't pre uh, kind of prepare for, right? And a responsibility because you need to answer for those collective effects. That's the sort of thing we need to deal with climate change, that you need to deal with a world that is so big in terms of information that you can't really see everything and plan and have a clear picture of the world all at once. It's very much contemporary as fuck. You know, so uh, it's implied in a lot of what Karatani is saying, not clearly developed, but I tend to think it's the best place to pull if you want to find a common thread that also binds him to other interesting contemporary thinkers and so on. Yeah. No, it's a nice way of thinking about what the, the organizational structure under D, mode D, or free association would be able to produce in a negative, not in a negative sense, but in the kind of negative tension of its organization, like like the problem that we've had in or conversation we've had in prior pod podcasts, where we say, um, if a socialist collective is organizing um, on principles uh, that adhere to some of these logics of free association and things, or introduce new forms of equality. Of relation amongst themselves they're going to produce new problems which will be different than the problems they might experience at the job or the workplace or ordinary capitalist institutions and that those problems are what's novel about what's produced it's not some carnival or some celebratory free association yeah and i think another another interesting reference for this which was a reference to a really amazing text which i think can be read into this discussion very easily by a mathematician who writes under the pseudonym of Aurora Apolito. She wrote a text called uh, Anarchism, the scale problem in anarchism and the case for cyber communism, something like this. She's oh, a, yeah. a brilliant mathematician and she writes about this. And in this text, she quotes a study uh, that was done by quantitative historians, quantitative like sociologists of quantitative uh, data about, you know, so this, there is this sesh hat I don't know how to pronounce it, database of a bunch of polities throughout history. 
and they cross-reference a bunch of parameters to try to understand like patterns between societies and so on. And they published a really cool paper, which I forget the exact name. We mentioned it when we were studying the study group uh, called Information and Scale Threshold in the Holocene, something like this. And they show there is a correlation between these two parameters, which is the size or scale of societies and their capacity to integrate information throughout that polity, that, that society, right? So if you're a small society, you don't need a very complex or, or, or even sometimes the contrary. You can have very complex social systems because there's very not that much information you need to store. So you can have complex relationships with one another. For example, reciprocity actually gives rise to almost fractal-like complex social relations. But you don't need to know the name of like thousands and thousands and thousands of people that you barely interact with through a social network. You can, things are a bit more restricted. So to integrate the information about the society of that scale is different. And uh, with certain informational means, societies can scale up to the point that the very informational means that allowed us to scale up no longer can integrate the information of that larger society. And then you need, either you develop better informational tools or you collapse. And they show that there is this interaction between the two things. To scale up, you need some way of integrating information, but this can put you in a position that you're too big to integrate information with that social logic. And then either you develop a new one and new technologies and continue to grow or you disappear. And they show this, this thing. And I find that we can give an analysis of dominance of mode A, B, and C, where they can be shown to be different types of, to have different capacities of integrating information about societies. Therefore, societies tend to grow to a certain size under their dominance. And either another mode gains kind of priority and manages to scale up even further, or those societies disappear. So there is a very nice integration between these things. And if I just I mean, I don't want to go into the nerdy details of what we've been developing, but just to bombastically throw them in your face, I told you that I have like a, we've been developing a kind of good reasoning about the emergence of modes themselves. And we realize that the three modes correspond to the three logical types we know of. Uh, you know, we have the Aristotelian logic with the principle of non-contradiction and the excluded middle. Well, if you, if you keep, keep it like that, you have classical logic, which is pretty much the logic of state. The logic of property is the logic of uh, either agreement obtains or an agreement doesn't obtain. Either I own something or I don't own something. You cannot kind of own something, right? It's a classical logic. If you suspend the principle of non-contradiction you get and you allow for contradictions, you get what we call paraconsistent logic. Well, the logic of reciprocity is paraconsistent. We've been doing a lot of work to show that most of the descriptions of how gift works shows that the logic of gift giving and counter, counter gift is a paraconsistent logic. And one of the ways we can show this is that if I give you a gift, the only way you give me a gift of the same value is if it's not of the same value. So the, a gift is only appropriate if it's not appropriate, right? If I give you exactly the same, the, the deal is off. You're offending me, right? And this is also a way of showing that you, if you take the logic of gift giving to the extreme of modern societies, you pretty much get the logic of psychoanalysis and our way of dealing with the other, where you have, you know, me, the other, and at the level of the boundary between me and the other, you have this impossible object. Like these things are also, we can also show they're connected. And if you suspend the excluded middle and allow for values that are intermediary between true and false, you get what we call intuitionistic logic. And that's pretty much the logic of value. The logic of value allows things to be totally exchangeable, totally not exchangeable, but be exchangeable in the middle. So that let's say if I have $10 and you have something, the thing might be worth $10, but it might be worth only half of what I have, like $5. So it's intuitionistic in that sense. So each one what of the modes- What about D? I, D is <laughs> no clue, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not no clue. It's classical. No, it's not. It's not a mode. <laughs> so I can it could show be. that it could be. It could be. No, I mean he could prove it. I mean it could happen in the future. He could. No, but look, I 
Sure. But isn't it interesting that we can correlate each mode to one type of logic, classical and distributed paraconsistent. Yeah. We don't know of another logic and they relate to mode A, B, and C. So we can show that sociality as it tries to become consistent in any logical form should give us mode A, B, and C. Now, further, further interesting development. We know from psychoanalysis that the logic of speech, the way that meaning is produced between our speaker and other is paraconsistent. It's, I tell you something, but you're kind of inside of me as I tell you and vice versa. It's a weird logic. Mode A tends to be focused on or orality as a means of propagating social forms. Mode B tends to be based on the logic of written texts, written law. And writing is classical. Either Contact. the word is there right. or it's not there. But the very like means of writing is classical. It's black and white, right? There's no gray. And the, the way of, of embedding the logic of, of capital in the world is neither through oral or, or speech traditions, nor through written traditions, but through objects and the technical existence of objects, right? Now, you can see oral traditions are very bad at integrating at large scales because you need to like spread the word. So integrating societies through mode A has a certain threshold. If you have the written culture, it tends to be easier to integrate much larger societies, but still you have some thresholds that if you're integrating societies through objects and technical objects, you can do it even bigger. So you can combine the three modes, give them logical forms and explain why they have different informational thresholds in a very kind of consistent way, none of which applies to mode D. So that's a, also a good reason to say probably we're treating as a mode something we actually wanted to give a different name. And in our approach, we've been developing on our group, we just give it a totally different construction, which I feel keeps everything that Karatan is proposing that is useful about the mode D, we're not criticizing the philosophy is useful, that free association is something worth pursuing, that there is a long history of, you know, proto-socialist or socialist-like experiments. We're just not saying this is an economic principle that exists transcendentally somewhere. Uh, but I think we have enough uh, material to show that we shouldn't really deal with this as if it is uh, uh, a mode, you know, like reciprocity, uh, commodity exchange and property logic. Wow. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This has been a two hours and 47 minute uh, time. Wow. That flew by for me. Um, Gabriel, thank you for uh, elucidating this text, this thinker, multiple texts. Um, and I hope this was helpful. I know it was probably torturous not to allow you to use the diagrams, especially with Karatani, because he's so um, he invites di diagram. <laughs> I mean, you need the visual, but um, we will we will put a link to the workshops that we did a couple years ago, uh, which are very good, and actually do exist on this YouTube page um, in a playlist if you scroll down. So, cool, great man! It was a pleasure. It's ridiculously late here. I uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I, to keep I hope going. I'm not like too confusing right now in the way I'm presenting things and, and already a bit kind of sleepy, but it was really fun. Yeah, it was great, man. Yeah. I mean, I hope that this was an invitation for folks to read Karatani at the minimum and to really benefit. I mean, I would just hope that they're translating the new work. Um, so we get, so we get a hold of it soon and um, okay. Until next time, everyone. See you all. Bye-bye.